Hello, everyone, and welcome to Weekly Manga Recap on January the 18th, 2017, and welcome to the Welcome to the Ballroom episode. Uh, was I supposed to wear something fancy besides a, I, I guess. a sweatshirt covered in dog hair? I don't know, I'm, I'm wearing a Kuroko t-shirt, so I don't think so. <laughs> Is that like your official podcast uniform? It's like always a Kuroko? I've only like, got so many t-shirts, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> How many t-shirts do you have? Oh, uh, let's see, I've got that one. You're like, Kuroko, um... I've got the Attack on Titan Samurai Jack one. And then I've got about 300 billion that have skulls on them. <laughs> what the... It was something I just noticed eventually after I, after I collected them. I was just like, I've got a lot of t-shirts that have skulls on them. <laughs> and looking back on it, I don't think I'm hardcore enough of a dude to be wearing these Not all the time. nearly! <laughs> I remember that. I remember last year when we went out drinking, and your your, your friends gave me shit because I, I happened when I had the boo boo on my finger. <laughs> I was wearing this hardcore ass t shirt that has skull on. <laughs> that's right, you were. I like to think that's the 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 brilliant irony of your wardrobe, though, is that people who know you get the joke, and everyone who yeah. doesn't's like, I bet that kid's really tough. Yeah. Man, his t-shirt says, don't fuck with me, motherfucker. But his face says, hey, folks! <laughs> his face says, golly, how much alcohol is in this apple cider? Can you go Can you go oh, easy wow. on the cider and high on the apple? That point one pr proof that point one proof beer is really getting me buzzed. It's got me schnockered, as they say. <laughs> as the kids say. I'm outright blottoed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm age. getting lit as we speak. <laughs> That's what the kids say today. I know, I'm Nick. I'm hip with the kids. Well, the tough kids. We're a gang. The, the Skull T-shirt gang. If you don't get my lingo, then I guess you're not hanging out with the hardcore crowd, bitch. <laughs> Biatches. <laughs> oh. God. Well, now I'm all in character, so we can talk about the protagonist of this series, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> this is our brilliant transition into a series about a fucking numb nuts who gets into ballroom dancing. Yes. Uh, this is a suggestion that we took called Welcome to the Ballroom, also known as Ballroom A Yokoso, which is Japanese for Welcome to the Ballroom. Shut up. I was like, so and it's Welcome to the Ballroom. <laughs> It is all about competitive ballroom dancing. We did actually talk about a series for a few weeks for when the jump starts, uh, Straighten Up, mm -hmm. which was about competitive ballroom dancing. Um, but then it stopped running in the English version of the magazine and we weren't interested enough to really follow up on it. Uh, and this, like that one, is a shonen series. It's uh, published by Kodansha instead of uh, Shueisha. I forget what magazine it runs in, but it's a monthly series been going on for like five years something like that um a decent amount of time i thought uh i thought it was kodansha it is kodansha oh, okay i said that oh, i sorry, said kodansha sorry, not okay. i said kodansha not, not uh, um i think since 2011 or 2012 it? Oh, a monthly shonen magazine is where it mm -hmm. runs um actually went on hiatus for like all of last year when oh. the yeah, the author just, you know, went suddenly ill. And uh, right around the time that we started reading it, uh, they announced that it was going to be making its comeback. I think it's going to be published in next month's edition of the magazine again. And uh, it's also getting an anime series. So Quite I would say that, that yeah, I, that's very fortunate timing, I think, is, uh, you know, in case you decide to pick up this series, it's not like, oh, it's stranded in a wasteland of hiatus and it has been forever. It's like, well, it's just starting to make a comeback. So, I mean, if you wanted to get into it, that would probably be the time to. Mm. Uh, this, like uh, Straighten Up, portrays competitive ballroom dancing as essentially like a sports manga would. Uh, it's a non-traditional sports manga. And it actually heavily reminded me of some other sports manga that I've read in terms of how it's set up and how the characters bounce off each other. Um, those series being Baby Steps and Hajime no Ippo. Uh, okay. It becomes more like the former than like the latter as we go through it, but... Because the setup is that essentially our main character, Tatara, uh, 
just joins this dance academy kind of by accident. Um, he meets uh, the big star of the dance studio, Sengoku, when the guy saves him from bullies. And uh, the guy just kind of takes him into the dance studio and he learns about it, which is literally exactly how uh, Hajime no Ippo begins. Um, and uh, the guy is kind of hard on him while he's getting more and more into, into dance, but he actually does care about his success, even though he's got no... Uh, it, he seems to have no uh, talent for it at first, which is, again, just like Ippo. So Goku was reminded me a lot of Takamura at first, uh, because he is a loud, boastful per pervert. Um, but as things go on, the series kind of becomes less cartoonish. I don't know if you got that same impression. But, but oh, I yeah. Did. I mean, the series starts off giving you the impression that it's going to be not only just one thing, but that it's also going to be going in a certain direction with a couple of its characters. Um, not to dig too much into the series itself, but uh, I'm going to have to call him Fujita because Tatara is like a fucking, that's like a caveman word to me. Like, Tatara, fight big bird in sky, Tatara. <laughs> uh, Fujita, what when an he initially... Inappropriate image to have in your head of that guy <laughs> in that case. When he shows up uh, at the... The dance studio basically he gets inspired to kind of try out dance because of the girl who's there shizuku mm -hmm. who's a classmate of his and one that he kind of has a crush on basically from this she kind of becomes a bit of his muse in dance but ultimately he just kind of has a little bit of a thing for her. and they kind of build up to this idea that maybe he's like that's the end goal of this is that the two of them like it's going to be a relationship about the two of them learning to be dance mm -hmm. partners because there's even a point early on where He's because he sucks. He isn't good at dancing and he has he's, no partner. Yeah. But they know, like, well, you have to shadow dance alone by yourself. And he's shadow dancing alone. And, like, they ask Sengoku, like, what's the best advice you can give for someone who's doing this? And Sengoku, because he's blunt and an asshole, is basically like, you should always be dancing with a partner. <laughs> <laughs> and then he passes by Fujita at one point and he is doing something that they referenced a little bit early on where he's dancing so in sync with his shadow that it's basically mimicking as though you were dancing with another partner. And for a brief moment, Sengoku's like, it looks like he was dancing with Shizuku. And you're like, that was where I was like, oh, is that what this is going to be about? Because it's such like a, like a cheesy moment that felt kind of hollow. Because it was like, it's not like he knows her that well at this point. They've known nah, each other really. a couple of weeks. And it built up this idea like they were supposed to be like the romance of the series. I guess there's still a possibility that maybe it is, but that's not the direction the whole series goes mm -hmm. in going forward. And in fact, the two of them dance together once and not by like intention. And then after that, they're essentially rivals mm -hmm. and it takes a much different element and the story starts moving in different directions. So, yeah, it does start off a little cartoonish. It has that premise that I think we've seen before where. You know, a down in his luck loser doesn't feel like he has anything in the world. He just gets kind of grabbed into a big world that otherwise they didn't know about and just kind of goes from there. You know, Sen Goku is kind of a cartoonish character at the start, too. Like just being sort of like an irresponsible adult that has way too much authority over children. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, I, I, we, it continues to grow when you get a larger cast and you start seeing like, oh, there's like actual like legitimate drama between these characters and. More than that, there's legitimate complexity in these characters, too. It, you know, it's... I think simple would be one of the last ways I'd describe this series, because this is a series with a lot of intricacies to its characters mm -hmm. and the way it flows. Shizuku, uh, to continue the Ippo, par Ippo parallels, um, she reminds me of Miata, who is Ippo's main rival uh, in this series. And to explain that... Uh, Ippo and Miata have... Miata is Ippo's first opponent. He has a practice match with him uh, at the very beginning of the series to kind of prove that he's been, you know, making progress learning boxing. And by a stroke of luck, he manages to get a lucky punch in and he defeats him. And from that point on, though, I mean, it's clear that Miata is like the superior boxer. He just literally had a complete lucky shot that managed to just strike him in the chin. Um... And uh, so Ippo sets Miata as his goal, and they go forward as rivals from that point. The series is like almost 1,100 chapters old 
at this point, and they have not fought since that first fight. They, it's a constant thing where they're constantly setting their sights on each other and they want to have a fight, but they have different career goals and they have branched off from each other. Mm-hmm. And it's to the point where it looks like they are never going to fight again. Uh, I'm sure that they probably will eventually, but it's you know going to be one of the signs that the series is actually ending. Yeah. Uh, after <laughs> <laughs> a couple millennia or so. Well, I mean, it came out. It, it started the same year that I was born, to give you an idea. So, um, and uh, ballroom is, first, is like the that. The first volume was printed out with like a quote of like, "I think this is amazing." Ronald Reagan. It's like, huh? <laughs> Why was he reading boxing manga from Japan? <laughs> Well, Ballroom is like that. Uh, it makes it seem as though uh, Shizuku and uh, Tatara are going to become dance partners at the beginning, especially because Shizuku's regular dance partner um, ends up getting injured. Mm-hmm. And the, the guy the guy even tells Tatara, because he can tell that they match each other well, is like, you know, you have to, like, you know, take care, take of, care, her. Of, take care of her. Um, that guy is, like, pretty much healed up before Tatara ever <laughs> even does that. <laughs> Um, you know, that's getting a little ways ahead in the series, but they make it up as this, it's this idea that, oh yeah, Tatara and Shizuku are like destined to be dance partners. And he keeps on carrying this torch up until the series where the series currently is, but yeah, they haven't danced since very early on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she's become much more of this rival figure for him. Uh, she is kind of transfixed by Tatra and there's something about him that really pushes her despite the fact that he's a rookie. Um, but you know, they really haven't moved beyond the initial stages of Tatra's infatuation with her up to this point. He respects yeah. her more as a rival figure as well, but it's actually, it's actually a, it's actually a little bit creepy at points the way he he feels towards her. <laughs> it is. It's 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 tough to completely define in one way because it seems to be a combination of both, as you said. It, it there's definitely a respect, and I I truly think that he does see something in her that's something of a muse. That's he sees like something in her that he kind of mm-hmm. always looks to as the reason why he's in this world to begin with. And she sees something in him, as does almost everybody in this series, that they can't define. There's no reason why he should be so many people's, like, challenge or something that people want to develop because they're like, something is here that I want to be tested against. Because he's he's hot garbage most of the time. Like, he's you know, screws up the basics for a while of the series. They eventually, uh, they eventually go with this idea that he is talented in all of the wrong ways. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to make a comparison that may make you mad with me. Okay. He's kind of like Tim Tebow. Oh, that where he's mad. <laughs> well, because well, because I went to University of Florida, and so some people are sick of me phrasing oh. him. But, <laughs> well, Tebow, for those of you who don't know football, was a quarterback who was honestly a terrible quarterback, but he was good at all of these things that people call the intangibles. He was a strong leader. He was remarkably athletic. He still is, uh, even now that he's left football. Um, So all the things that you would want from a quarterback, normally he didn't have, but all the things that you would like as bonuses for your quarterback, he had those in spades. Mm -hmm. But he did not succeed in the NFL because, well, you know, he showed flashes of brilliance. Because Tom Brady didn't start mentoring him and giving him tips like, there's something in you. Pretty much. I need to see us in the Super Bowl. Pretty much. Uh, you know, in in the in, you know, if T- M. Tebow had been in the manga world, he would have been a great sports protagonist. Oh, he'd been amazing. But uh, well, up until he was just like, and my th- and my number one priority is God. Okay, <laughs> yeah, <I was laughs> can't like, follow might, you that far. He, he might have to cut down a couple Bible quotes, but otherwise, he's, he's solid. The, no, no, Tim, Tim. Oh, 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 he got on his knee again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. So that's the thing about Tatra is that he is incredibly good at following someone, which you can't do in traditional ballroom dance because the man has to be the leader. Uh, They have to set the pace and 
direct their partner on what they're going to do and basically be this strong masculine force uh size is something that gets pushed a lot uh, uh literally the man's size as compared to his partner uh can really strike the judges in a way and tatra is a short kid yeah uh, like a, a lot of the time his partner will be just as tall as he is even maybe a little bit shorter a little bit taller sorry and so because of that you know it's like the 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 dynamic is completely off with them. It should be one way and instead of another. And it's not like the series is about, oh, we're going to change this musty old sport of ballroom dance where you're going to show them, you know, how, what dancing really can be. It's not like that. Everyone acknowledges that he has some talent. <laughs> There's like a talking dog partner for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, voiced by Will and Eric, like, let's do this, guys. <laughs> he steals like a police ballroom. car. <laughs> Welcome to the barroom, debuting soon on the Disney Channel. <laughs> like, wow, they got Will Arnett for this. Bravo! <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, he's in everything. <laughs> this guy's everywhere. Uh, he's just playing Lego Batman. <laughs> <laughs> That's a donkey dog. <laughs> <laughs> now give her a spin. Wolf, wolf, bark, bark. <laughs> <laughs> My parents are dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you brought up a point though that you know he he does have a talent to him he absolutely has something and that's something that is kind of slowly kind of brought out throughout the series is what exactly is it that makes uh fujita special because something is in him that has caused sengoku uh you know world caliber the only world caliber talent in japan to be uh his trainer you know completely pro bono it seems like essentially uh the reason why uh hyodo who is the best dancer in japan at his age is giving this guy advice this complete newcomer advice and instruction and help on how to get better even if it's through tough love or like legitimate friend kind of advice um, there has to be some reason why so many people are kind of drawn to us and this series is as i mentioned about five years long at this point it's been running and a good portion of this essentially takes place over one arc i guess you'd call it the the 10 pay cup and around that point is when we start actually getting to see what it is that makes uh fujita special that's where you start kind of seeing where his talents really lie you know he's had like flashes in the pan before but this is like his first real shot to show off and that's why i kind of also feel like this series really starts showing its best uh talents itself you know that's why i think everything starts falling into a more interesting place and starts building up some really dynamic and interesting relationships between these characters once they have that uh the, that first the ten pay cup arc mm -hmm. i think it's called which is weird. long as shit it is ridiculously it's surprisingly, long. it's surprisingly long honestly yeah this one where we get to know mako right yes mako yeah. and gaju um which is interesting because essentially tatra wins and loses at the same time <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't, I don't want to spoil too much for it because i know there are some people out here right. who are who are still going to be maybe listening to this and i don't want to get into spoilers or too much yet but, right uh this, I mean, not to, to to cut around any corners or anything like that, but this was a surprisingly uh, excellent series to me. I, I guess there's no other kind of way to put. It. I was not expecting to enjoy this series as much as I did because, you know, I, I think even when we talked about straightened up, I, I feel like ballroom dancing or any dancing in general kind of has a difficult hill to climb when it comes to a manga adaptation of it, since it's. Uh, you know, uh, an art style that I feel has its appeal laid within transitions and music. And neither one of those are things that you can convey through the art of, of manga particularly well. So I, I already kind of had, you know, a little bit of low expectations about how effective this series is going to be at managing to convey the art form to me. But uh, after it gets to that 10 pay arc and kind of beyond that, this series, I feel, is like frighteningly good at times. Like it, it really 
doesn't cut corners on relationships. It doesn't stop with simple characterizations or things like that. You know, there's there's still layers to things we don't even know at this point. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. maybe this was revealed in the last couple chapters. I only managed to get about 35 or so chapters in. But uh, we still don't actually know what the reason is that uh, drove Sengoku to decide to teach uh, Fujita. Like we, no, get we still don't of, know that. Yeah, yeah, we get kind of uh, ideas of it, but... There's still a lot to that character that we still don't know. And this is a, a series that I respect a lot because it continues to change dynamically as the series goes on. Um, in one big way, I'll just say uh, Sengoku is the, tre- the, the, the trainer. Uh, he's uh, Fujita's trainer at the start of the series. You know, I, I won't cut away from anything like that, but I will say he's not forever. You know, things change in their relationship and move on. And relationships alter and change because of that. Now, he's still a part of the series, no matter what. But it's just kind of interesting to see, you know, your Mr. Miyagi-like character is just gone. You know, he doesn't have well, that he's role. Busy. You yeah. know, he's, he travels around the world going to different dance competitions and stuff. And I think that that actually really plays to the, to the good of the series because it's not overly, overly relying on him. Yes. Uh, Tatra has got to la- learn to stand on his own without Sengoku's guidance. Uh, he's always thinking about him because he's, he kind of thinks there's part of him that wants to uh, justify all the investment that Sengoku's put into him and live up to uh, whatever expectations he has for him. But he's not constantly there watching. And uh, that allows Tatra and the other characters to stand on their own and to develop without him. Uh, As we go forward, we get more and more characters in this series. Uh, Tatra gets more and more rivals uh, that, you know, you hope to see him overcome. It seemed as though we were on the verge of him getting a chance to do that uh, without giving too many details. Um. But a big part of the series is uh, Tatra getting his actual partner that he's going to dance with. Because at first it seems like, oh, you know, it'll be it'll be Shizuku eventually. Uh, he dances with uh, with with one girl Mako for a bit, and, and she really manages to shine while she's dancing with him. But they're not actually a good match, uh, and that was a, a one time thing anyway. Then we get his actual partner, and they have such an interesting goddamn dynamic. I, I, I freaking love the way that these two are set up because it it made me feel so nostalgic for team sports manga that I've read. You know the the group of misfits uh, getting together because we know what's wrong with with Tatra and what's good about him, and then we meet Shinatsu, and she's the inversion of him. It's explained that when she she's been dancing for a really long time since her youth, and you know when girls have a group that dances together, inevitably one of them has to take the lead if it's you know just the girls dancing together, and she took the lead for her and her childhood partner for like their entire time together, so she's used to leading, and Tatra is good at following when he should be leading, so. They're both bad at what they should be doing. <laughs> they're amazing at what they're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> exactly. And so they match up against each other and they, you know, want to it they're they would be really talented if she were leading him instead of the other way around. And because of that, they're at once a good match and a horrible match mm. because the stuff that they sh- that they could be covering for each other, though you can't do that. You can't have Chinatsu make up for Tatara's mistakes. He's got to be the one taking the lead in order for them to be judged well. And so there are people who are kind of watching them being like, oh, is this going to go well for them? Because, you know, they seem like an actual horrible match. It seems like they're actually compounding each other's shortcomings instead. And they have a really interesting dynamic. It gets the the drama between them really starts to get really intense as the series go forward because they they don't know how to interact for such a big part of the series and things come to this big head where it looks like they're just going to completely collapse under the pressure uh, until 
they seem to finally start clicking at a certain point. It's so satisfying when they finally do because so much of it, the series is not even them like, you know, like, oh, they, they danced and then they lost or something like that. It's just them trying to match up with each other. Uh, I think that the actual dance in the series is probably, honestly, like one of the least noteworthy things about it. I would I would see a dance scene in this and it'd be like, well, their faces got weird and they started get, get their limbs started getting blurry. <laughs> their sp- their spines started to look really bendy. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll note this on that that point: the art in this series I think is really amazing. I, there's <laughs> some absolutely fantastic uh, physical art within the characters' physiques. Um, considering you know a portion of it is about dance too, it could have easily been a little like too fan servicey or things like that. But they actually. I feel, you know, I'm not a dance expert, but the physiques in the series actually feel, like, appropriate for, like, a dance. Like, they take a note to be like, oh, wow, like, the muscles of a dancer's back, like, that's how incredible, that's that's what it takes to hold that posture or whatever. That said, there are a lot of moments in this series where you will see teenagers spinning about with O-faces on, (laughs) because that's just, like, what the series is. Like with different like styles of facial features like being swung about because a lot of I guess their expressions are almost kind of forced but mixed with like a, a, a somewhat genuine emotion at the time. So it's a lot of points of like Aah! like flying about. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's also kind of weird that. Some of these stu- some of these you know dancers are so freaking young for the dresses that they that the girls get squeezed into. <laughs> I mean, it's like okay, well, it's traditional ballroom dance. This is what you wear, and like, it's a weird thing the way that they talk, just kind of matter of factly talk about bodies. You know, if, when it comes to the guys, it's like you know, look at that, look at his strong back, as he's got such a wide back that he, that uh, works so well, and he, you know he. He towers over her, and it's bad that Shinatsu is basically the same height as Tatra. Uh, but just because, um, like, Mako just, like, wears padding in her bra because she's so they, flat. <laughs> I thought they were going to make, like, a more of a joke. Because there is actually a moment where, like, something happens and the padding starts, like, shooting out of her bra and, like, tripping people. <laughs> Yeah. And like you almost expected like a fucking like a rim shot to go off or something. Like you're like, this is fucking ridiculous out of nowhere. Um it's really weird. I also this is something I just need to note. I, I really like this series for everything you know amazing it does. I think the one of the biggest things I will forever take away from it though, I am eternally tickled that there are images of this series of fucking ballroom dances while two dudes are swinging about screaming at each other in like a primal war of like like pure masculine adrenaline like oh it's it, it's really something that doesn't <laughs> like make you really visualize an actual dance a lot of the time yeah. because you know they they they, they it's descri- the dances are described in a way that lay people like us can understand what's going on. And that's what's good about the series is that even if you don't really understand, you know, the way the movements, the techniques, the way things are scored, it takes you by the hand and says, okay, this is the story I'm telling. So you don't have, you don't have to worry about what a pirouette is or what the fuck ever. Uh, You know, yeah, there's a point where Tatra and uh, the current guy that he's, competing against get the same idea in their head because they're sharing the same dance floor at the same time. They're like, we've got to make our way over to the judge's table. And it's like they're both <laughs> running while carrying their partners. It's so ridiculous. Like, look, it's a good kind of ridiculous because I'm, I'm like enjoying everything else in the series. So it's almost just kind of like a fun extra element to enjoy. But there is some sort of ridiculousness of seeing these dudes spin around on the dance floor with their mouths open like in a primal scream. It's fucking glorious. I, I will say, though, ultimately with this, because we mentioned at the top of this that this series recently just came back from a hiatus, hiatus and just got announced to get an anime on, uh, adaptation. Uh, it, it's I think it will be difficult for the anime to capture some of the art of the series particularly, but I do think that the adaptation might be a bit more enjoyable from that ability to actually see what's happening in the dance, because there's 
there's so many moments, especially early on, where you were you were meant to understand that uh, Fujita is inexperienced because he's screwing up even basic steps, or he is resorting to just using basic steps. And as a reader, there's nothing really, if you're not, I guess, very versed in dance, to really signify that. Characters have to constantly tell you this is happening. And perhaps mm -hmm. that's something that an actual, you know, visual animated adaption would be able to carry across a little bit more. Plus, there's also points where they talk about the music. You know, uh, there are points when Fujita's just, like, begging the music to actually start because he needs that rhythm. And, you know... I'm listening to fucking like "Come On, Feel the Noise" by Quiet Riot, and I'm just like, yeah, I can see that. You need the you need the music to pump you up. But that you know, it does it does I guess help when you actually can hear and use that music to kind of visualize actually what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of sport where you really do need that you know animated and audio uh, element in order to really translate what's going on and put you in the scene. Because like I was, I, like I was starting to say earlier, it really feels as though at times the dance scenes themselves are probably like not the main attraction of the series. I think that it's definitely more just the drama surrounding it, uh, the stress that uh, Fujita is putting himself and his partner through, the difficulty that uh, he and Chinatsu have in trying to get on the same page. Uh, that stuff was what really entranced me when I read this. Like, I read this pretty much the entire series in, like, the span of, like, two days. And I've been sitting on it for a few weeks. Uh, and I've just been like, oh, I want to talk about the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really like this uh, manga. Uh, and I am probably definitely going to keep on reading it uh, once it starts back up again. Yeah, I this this was an extremely pleasant surprise. I... I didn't think something like this could work, and not only did it work, it, it it's easily been one of the best sports manga I've read. Not just recently, but I think of all time. It really just captures so much of what makes sports manga good, in a way. I didn't think this sort of sport, because I'm not even going to try to be like, it's a ticky tack Like, it's it's a sport, in, in essentially mm -hmm. the ways. I'm not a fan of subjective sports, of like anywhere it's like it goes down to a judge's score, but like just everything that this series did impressed me, you know, it... It handles mature themes. I mean, uh, uh, ta, Fujita is the, the product of a divorced parent uh, household, and that actually yeah. plays a very significant element to his character. Even something small, like the fact that he actually literally describes and, and narrates sumo matches to his grandmother, who's hard of hearing, actually plays a part into why he's actually so good of a dancer like just that was little... such a weird thing honestly <laughs> but i i like that they actually take the time to try to show some of the stuff and as the series continues to grow characters and their relationships with one another do start to change and i i i'm you know i i really think that this is something that has a lot of uh quality strength to it the, the ten uh tenpei arc the tenpei cup arc um is a very long arc, but I, I that's the one that by the end of it I was completely hooked on the series because it, it it had so many strong highlights to it. It built to this fantastic crescendo and had a really emotional climax to it that was just satisfying. The the biggest weakness I could ever say for this series is that it is what it is. You know, it's a ballroom dance manga, and that's not going to be you know everybody's cup of tea. You know, it's. Sports manga is a niche on itself, and this is kind of a niche within a niche, you know. You keep an open mind and give it a try, but there's a lot of people who are just like, I just don't care about ballroom dancing. Anyway. Hey, you, hey, Yuri on Ice was the most successful anime last year. <laughs> who knows? I, 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 if if the, the anime adaptation of this is anywhere near the rest of the series quality, I firmly believe this Welcome to the Ballroom will be this year's Yuri on Ice. I, I think this has all the trademarks of it. Also, Sengoku has like two or three moments during the Tenpu Cup arc where I was like, this dude's going to make me fucking cry. <laughs> Blow them all away, Nick. Blow them all away. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's going to do it for a discussion of uh, Ballroom then. So let's move on to the recap portion of Weekly Manga Recap. Let's begin with My Hero Academia, number 122. A season for encounters. So, um, 
we're continuing with that opening ceremony that we uh, started off in the end of the last chapter. Uh, more speakers come up beginning with uh, Hound Dog, the school life supervisor, who uh, basic whose speech essentially goes like this. And... Um, <laughs> Then Blood King translates for him. <laughs> it's like, what a weird character. Because <laughs> he's got a freaking muzzle on. <laughs> um, essentially, uh, he says, there was a fight between students last night. Uh, so try to control yourselves and get along better. And everyone's like, what the fuck was that guy? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah. Um, people started uh, kind of talking uh, in the crowd. Um, a couple of unidentified students start talking, and uh, one is not listening to the other, and we don't get to see their faces, but one of them is drawn in a very, you know, serious, who is this person kind of way that they will that probably cuts be off to. right before the eyes. Mm hmm. Um, then we get a little bit of a time skip to uh, Aizawa having everyone in class later that day. Everyone, of course, except for Deku and Bakugo, who are on lockdown, which apparently means not only are they, you know, not allowed to leave the dorm for you know festivities and stuff, they're not allowed to leave the dorm even to go to class, and they're just going to have to catch up when they when they're out. Okay. Yeah, it's like that's a pretty fucking harsh punishment. They don't pay to go to the school, do they? <laughs> oh, they're wearing uniforms. They might. <laughs> no, it's Japan. Maybe not. Uh, so you uh, asks a question, uh, and after that, we get you know a, a couple of different clarifying questions asked as they start to talk about work studies because it was something that they heard at the opening ceremony. They don't really know what the hell is was being talked about. Uh, and Azawa says, okay, basically, uh, it's hero work outside of school. It's, you know, uh, what do you call it? Temp, not temping. What is it uh, called? God damn it. Well, you work. Interning. Right. Uh, an internship, essentially. Uh, I mean, they already did internships, but it is a more immersive version of that. Uh, and then Uraraka has a bit of a freak out and goes, wait, what was the point of trying so hard at the sports <laughs> festival? <then?" laughs> like, oh, yeah, you did really, really push yourself, get your ass kicked, didn't you? Um, and Ida is like, yeah, that's such a good point. You know, if, if these were available, then why would you need to go to the trouble of getting scouted at the sports festival if that was not actually your, our only option? And, uh, Aizawa says, uh, well, you see, you'll be using your networking connections from the sports festival to secure your hero work studies. It's all at your discretion to start with and unrelated to courses uh, here. Those of you who didn't get to the sports festival will have a hard time finding positions in the first place. So Rock is like, oh, I'm s yeah, sorry. Sorry, I uh, was about to kill you. Um, sorry. My bad. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is... I don't know if this is like a retcon, but... I think it's their way, uh, Horikoshi's way, of addressing the fact that it sounds as though this would make the whole effort of the sports festival superfluous by not retcon it, but essentially hand-waving it enough that it's just mm -hmm. like, look, it mattered, it's just this also matters. And Shut it up. Is that to kind of get, <laughs> but it may not, because not every... It, it, it's important. What you did was important. Uh, yeah, so, um, I thought it says, yes, this is awesome, bar. we'll talk about more, more about it later. Uh, anyway, Prism Mike to go teach class. And they're like, yeah, we're teaching English. <laughs> Why would you want him as a language teacher? <laughs> he finishes off that sentence with bruh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust this guy. <laughs> it's been a while since I bet you eat to see me take the stage again, bruh. <laughs> like, yeah, you teach them those prepositions. <laughs> Prep a what uh, now? Man. <laughs> I ain't got hemorrhoids. I'm like, 
Preparation H, you dumb motherfucker! <laughs> God damn it, Mike Check! I mean, I guess he's not teaching music class. <laughs> that seems like where he'd fit. Oh, God. Uh, we cut to the dorms again. Uh, Deku is in his room, a pump and iron. Yeah. Mm. Getting bulky. Yeah. Go to pump. You up. Uh, he observes that there doesn't seem to be any damage to his uh, to his arms currently. He doesn't feel any any pain or or weirdness in them, as he remembers the advice of the doctor who examined his arms. Uh, so he's like, "Yeah, you know, I was I was really conscious uh, about holding back yesterday, but as long as I'm having trouble keeping my emotions in check, maybe it'd be best to quit punching for a while. So I've got to buckle down and keep working on shoot style." Um, but he's making a little progress. It's a nice little note, I think, to touch in on with them. It's like, yeah, this is having an effect, a positive effect, what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, back to uh, Bakugo and Deku doing slave labor around the place. Uh, the other students are mocking them because they're observing. He's like, hey, look at all this dust by the window, Bakugo. He's like, oh, that Deku's job. Shut up. <laughs> he was supposed to do the windows, you motherfucker. How dare you? I bet that he actually takes pride in cleaning, though. Bakugo? Yes. I mean, remember, he, like, screams die plaque while brushing his teeth, so almost certainly. This space be fucking spotless! <laughs> uh, Deku overhears some of the students talking about work studies, but none of them are actually directly engaging him with it, so he's just joking at hearing different uh, students kind of talking nearby him, and he's like, oh no, I'm already falling behind! And, uh, Ida, who suddenly appears in front of me, is like, ah, it's written in, on your face how you're feeling. I'm angry at you, but since they forbade us from telling you to anything about our classes directly, so you'll just have to endure this, and, you know, deal with this experience as the punishment is meant to be. So there you go. So, Deku goes off, taking the trash out by himself, I was wondering what the hell's going on and falling behind. And uh, a face appears out of the wall next to him. Um, it's Pep Boy from Fallout. Pip Boy? Pip Boy, yeah. <laughs> Nick's like, I play all the I play the, I played games. the Outfall. <laughs> I've played the Falling Out games. <laughs> With the nuclear radiation <laughs> and the stat building and the bottle caps <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting the nick one more give me one more uh, uh yeah. hang on uh the third one is considered garbage by a lot of people no yeah, people seem to like the third one i think the people are split on it well the, new... the the traditionalists will say that it lost too many of its rpg elements and the new vegas was the one that uh, i think everyone liked new vegas i didn't like new vegas that much but okay most people do I was just looking for super mutants or Liam Deeson, Nick. Mutants, that was it. Yeah. Those were the orc-like things, right? Yeah. They have no balls. And the, and the, and the slow motion bullets. Bats! Right. People Bats. are like, wait, what is this podcast becoming? It's like, well, it's me describing Fallout series to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> was it uh, special are the stats, I think? Yeah. There okay, you go. You're getting everything. And Liam Neeson's your dad in Fallout 3. That's why it's not an awful game. Because what other game lets you be the offspring of Liam Neeson? I mean, he's an awful dad. Like, I try to take him to a fucking city and he just runs around. He sees, like, a fucking rad scorpion a mile away and he pulls out, like, a plunger. And he's like, how about he? And just fucking runs at it. It's like, Dad, we have places to be! Oh, okay. Regardless. Great game. Liam Neeson. Okay, so, um... <laughs> Yeah, uh, Deku notices uh, yeah, Pip Boy's face coming out of the wall. And he's like, oh, you're looking for where the garbage is? Yeah, yeah you should have to put put food trays in the like with the rest of the burnables over that way. And Deku's like, thank you. Thanks. And then the face disappears. He's like, what the fuck's going on? Face appears in, in the ground underneath him. Ah, oh, you're that excitable first year, aren't you? Ah! <laughs> He's <laughs> just like having a conversation with him with his face sticking up out of the ground. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry if I scared you. Oh, no, I was kind of open to scare you. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. 
It's like, oh, yeah, actually, I'm kind of wondering what I'm doing out here by myself. <laughs> anyway, you'll find out about me soon enough. Anyway, bye! <laughs> like, what? Did you just accost young children as they deliver trash? <laughs> Are you going to try to iron out my vagina now? <laughs> that is a callback. <laughs> It's one of my favorite manga we've ever covered. Jesus Christ. That is a great one. I'm going to have to listen to that after we're done. All right. So, um, yeah, he disappears. And Dick is like, what happened? <laughs> and uh, time passes. Uh, Deku is let off of uh, lockdown. And he's like, I'm sorry for causing all the trouble. I'm back. Uh, and uh, they're like, yeah, you know, we're, we're glad to have you back, uh, Deku. And Except for Jiro, who's just kind of like, Jesus Christ, why are you getting so freaking worked up? <laughs> Calm down. You're back he's in like, class. Why are you so like, happy? <laughs> spelling steam out of his nose to like a... No, I'm back. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like, you're just going back to class. Chill out. <laughs> so, uh, Aizawa announces, now that Midori is back, fuck Bakugo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here to tell you how work studies differ from your internships are some people who have gone out there and experienced it all. They're taking time out of their busy schedules to be here, so give them your full attention. Out of all the students here at UA, these are the top three reigning third years. We call them the Big Three. And three students walk in, and leading them is the Pip Boy guy. Who Pip he, he Boy! Looks even... Pip Boy! I said Pip Boy. I said Pip Boy guy. Is all. You're saying Pip Boy. I said Pip Boy guy. Because right, he's on. the guy who looks like Pip-Boy. Shut up. Carry I know on. what I'm talking about now. I know all about... <laughs> Look, I get it. Liam Neeson speed, and Super Mutants. <laughs> speed. Strength. Constitution. <laughs> Not star, but, but constitution. <laughs> <laughs> In dexterity without the D. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean my recap? Weekly manga recap. Welcome to the ballroom, aka Nick Explains Fallout. <laughs> Dog meat! There! Oh, there you go. That's a <laughs> Nailed it. Um so yeah, the Pip Boy guy is there with him. He looks even stranger with the full body shot because he's got like All Might arms, super detailed musculature with cartoonish face and horrible eyes. <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting you say that because based off of last chapter, Pip Boy guy seems to be the person that was originally considered for uh, one for all. Mm hmm. So with the hairstyle. Yeah, with that hairstyle. So the fact that he has like arms like that is kind of it's interesting. Like why is this one why is this guy considered all for one like a, a one for all candidate? And then why wasn't he picked? Um This is actually a pretty interesting chapter just in the sense and, that it's uh, like it's kinda introduced three new variables into things. Like we don't know who these characters are. You know, we know only that they're students here. Um there are given these kind of big introductions with this. And it's like, huh, what's going to be ultimately their role in this story? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a part of me that can't shake the fact that at least one of these guys, and I wouldn't be shocked if it turns out to be Pip-Boy guy here, is going to turn out to be evil. They're the mole or something like that. I, I wouldn't be shocked if there was something to that element. I mean, I feel like there had to be a reason why All Might didn't give it to that guy. But more than anything, it's just kind of interesting to get new characters with kind of interesting designs, too. Well, uh, yeah, there is, there's him. I mean, he looks, you know, completely unlike any character in the series thus far, which is saying something considering the wide assortment of different designs we've gotten in My Hero. Uh, although he is also accompanied by uh, Kurokiba and Alice, if Alice had long hair. <laughs> I mean, I looked at, I looked at, the guy, at the guy and I was immediately like, Kurokiba. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have his bandana on, so he's not fired up, Nick. That's right, exactly. Um, this is interesting. Uh, very much a setup chapter. 
but uh, did have that nice shock of introducing this uh, complete, currently unnamed character to us. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun too. Like just even getting to see the uh, the guy like face pop through a wall. I'm guessing he has mm-hmm. some kind of phasing power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely All right. dig it. Let's move on to Fairy Tale Chapter Five Hundred and Seventeen. Wendy Belsarion. So if you remember last time, uh, Wendy and Urza were fighting against Irene, and she revealed her super powerful transformation magic, her enchanting magic. Nick is savaging this pizza uh, that she basically used to take over Wendy's body. And she did so. The end of the chapter, she had taken over Wendy's body. And that's how we start here with her talking about like, Ah, the new body, my body. Well, the, the thigh has sustained heavy damage, bruising over the entire body and internal injuries as well. And I'm like, when the fuck did she get internal injuries? How bad are these internal injuries? And she's still walking around. She's like eight. <laughs> Whatever. And of course, it all ends with the uh, the expected joke line of, what's this? What a cute bust line. And I'm like, She's 10! Does she even have a bust line? Do they even start measuring that on girls at her age? Stop it! But- as soon as this happened, from this point forward, I was like, shit. It was like, I, something in me snapped. And I was just like, you know what? Well, to give you context, I think that um, my, uh, When we talked about Black Clover last week, I got into I got into a very big it was like fuck all this, you know. And then afterwards, I think I got into it as I was reading manga for this week. I was like, I'm just gonna try and have a good time reading all the manga that I don't normally. And fairy tales, of course, at the time that was because like it's so stupid. And I was like, you know, what? I'm just gonna try and sit back and enjoy this. And I was just like, you know what? Even if I have to like it, ironically. I'll do it. And that is what I ended up doing. This chapter is the most fairy tale chapter. (laughs) And I was almost cheering by the end of it because I was like, yes, you did not do anything I wouldn't expect you to. (laughs) All of this was within expectations. The freaking bus line joke. Everything. Second bus line joke. Just. Just, just go. I'm not going to interrupt you anymore. Just okay. go through, through to the end. So, yes, she's taken over Wendy's body and comments that her old body is nothing more than a lump of fresh now. And the old Wendy no longer exists because she is her now. And she, she kicks Urza away and she's like, sorry, but mommy is the only one being rejuvenated today. And, you know, how could a child like me possibly have a kid? Well, I'll just have to kill you to make sure that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so she starts flying around using Wendy's uh, wind magic, and she's like, oh, this is so much fun. I'm amazing. This wind magic is so powerful. I am Wendy now. Wendy Belsarian. And then someone actually, no, Urza runs up the tower to try to cut her apart, basically to try to attack. And she's like, "I, how can you, you, you do this to somebody? And. That's when she starts you know, thinking about all the moments she shared with Wendy over the years, which I didn't remember most of these, but I'm sure they happened and I've just blocked them out. Uh, but Urza can't basically do it because she has too many memories of, of, of uh, Wendy and she, you know, lets her attack down at the last moment. And evil Wendy or whatever we have to call her for the extent of this chapter, spoilers, it doesn't last very long, uh, knocks her away and says, you're far too soft, Urza. And now, I'll chant your armor to explode! And her, there's a huge explosion. And we see Urza after the blast, and she's perfectly fine, and she's looking at her chest. And I was actually a little surprised by this, because I would assume they were like, the explosion didn't hurt me at all, except it blew open the shirt I had on. <laughs> Doesn't do that, but she's not hurt at all, barely. And we hear someone say, Dues Corona. Corona? Whatever. You know the words it's saying. It boosts combat abilities versus all types. It's very video game. I don't know why the boss... Anyway. So I had this idea. Since we're both enchanters, maybe I could do the same thing. It took me a little bit longer, though. 
Urza-san, it's me, Wendy. And that's where we see Irene's body has risen up. And as you can kind of glean pretty quickly, Wendy has used the same kind of enchanting magic that when her body was taken, used it so she would then take over Irene's left behind body. And she notes like, ah, your magic power is amazing. Taking my body was a real mistake in your part. It's like, yeah, it was. <laughs> she mentioned it before. She's like, ah, shit, that body was much more powerful. Uh, and she's actually just like beating the shit out of Wendy. <laughs> uh, Wendy's old buddy, I guess Irene. I don't know what the fuck to call it anymore. And Irene's like, what do you, how can you do this? You, you think you could force me out of this body? And Wendy says, yes, I do. My magic power is far greater than yours now. So you will give me back this body. Dot, dot, dot. I admit, this larger bust would be nice to have. But this tiny body is where I've lived all my life. So, Irene does something kind of interesting. She starts, like, tearing into her own body, into Wendy's body. And she's like, do you want this body now? Do you want it now? Do you want it now? I'm going to destroy it. I'm never giving this back. You can't have it back. I got kind of with one like Dean. <laughs> so, Wendy says to her, the wounds on my body are the proof of the life I've led. They're badges of honor that I earned fighting for fairy tale. So give me as many as you'd like. But the body that remembers every touch that ever mattered to But that body remembers every touch that ever mattered to me. And... Ugh, yeah, wording. Well, I really wish they'd use better wording than that on it. Uh, I don't know exactly. I guess... Wendy just... Or, or Irene just says, well, fuck it, and transfers them back. Like, I think that they... I think that they, um imply that um, Irene could not actually resist the reversal of the enchantment because her magic wasn't strong enough. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah, they switch, they unfreaky Friday. Yes. And Wendy is so exhausted by this that she, she, she falls over and says, Urza, uh, could you take it from here? So Urza equips a new armor and she's like, yes, I will finish this. And that is the end of this chapter. <laughs> Okay, let's recap. All right. <laughs> let's recap this recap. So, Evil Wendy pops up and immediately goes for the, oh, but her breasts are so small, it's so cute. It's immediately gets that out of the way. Yes! <laughs> and they have to fight. And of course, Wendy's an Irene's body. Who could have seen that coming? And she's like, oh, these tits are so heavy. <laughs> what was the point? I don't oh, fucking know. Oh, his tits are so heavy, oh, they are. Oh, so heavy with the sagging. And the oh, they're Sherry Lewis. The 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 Climb in these giant gazongas. <laughs> so hard in my back, what even? With the nipples and the cleavage. <laughs> oh, pretty lady. These boobs <laughs> are enormous. Um, <laughs> before that, we get Irene holding Wendy's body hostage, and Urza remembers all the wonderful times they had together. Because if there's one thing I remember about Fairy Tale, it's the unbreakable bond between Urza and Wendy. Yeah. And of course, their her sequence of memories of them together caps off with them embracing nakedly in the bath. Because what else would you end on? <laughs> then Wendy gets up as Irene. Uh, and is like, and I can use your magic too because I'm stronger than you. I can't believe you didn't think of that. And she's like, and my body, even though it doesn't have big tits, is very important to me, I guess. And <laughs> so it's like, she's doing, here's the thing. I actually kind of like the speech from Wendy a little bit because it, it shows her side of her we don't normally get that way. Like, Wendy does have this like small sense of warrior's pride where she's like, yeah, all these wounds that I have, like, those are actually important to me, because those are, those are a testament of the struggles I've gone through with my friend. It actually mean more if Fairy Tale didn't constantly always have the sexiest damage to characters possible, essentially, <laughs> but I like, the, I like the sentiment of it, that, like, Wendy actually is, she doesn't care about her body being hurt, because it's all about the struggle and everything like that, and how it's all for her guild, and this is a war, so she's, she's you know, she's, she's fine with it, you know, she's happy if you give her more, because it just means it's, it's more that she sacrificed for friends. Not perfect, but fine. But it, the fact that it has to be prefaced by, I admit, bigger tits would be great. <laughs> but my friends, for real zos, <laughs> that's the true magic. <laughs> and it 
all caps off, of course, this entire chapter. I love is. these giant watermelon of <laughs> <laughs> But uh, there's so much more fun to play with! <laughs> I'm handfuls of these things! But, hold on! Friends are important! Let me get, a, let me get about a minute more of squeezing and bouncing in, and then we'll switch bodies back. Guys, I'm gonna be right back! Can you, can you two put this on hold? Time out! <laughs> I'm gonna go jump rope in front of a mirror. <laughs> She's like, guys, can you excuse me for one minute? Bitty, 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 bitty. <laughs> like, what are you doing? She motorboating herself? Yeah, she, yeah, she... Might as well. <laughs> so, to cap off this sequence of friendship speeches, friendship and bathhouse memories, uh, of course I'm stronger than you. You had the stronger body moment. And just playing with tits... Then, of course, it all caps off this chapter with, well, Irene got to be in Winnie's body for less than one full chapter before it was reversed! And we're all back to normal now! Like, that's it! It's the ultimate fairy tale chapter. Stupid fan service, friendship speeches, friends in the bath memories, an evil villain that is completely the same as every other villain we've seen so far, and... <laughs> The, the horrible situation introduced at the end of the last chapter reversed at the end of the next one. I love this chapter because it was so fucking expected. <laughs> it really does make you think, like, what exactly was the point of Wendy in this? Because if you cut this part out, it's not as though anything really has changed. You could literally this. take this chapter out and would not change the battle that Urza and Irene are having at all. Yeah, like, it, it does feel a very a good deal. I guess... This needed to be the 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 catalyst to get Urza angry enough to want to fight. Uh, I, I guess she need she she's like um she's like a reverse Superman, Nick. You know, Superman gets weak when Kryptonite's around him. What, Urza just needs a fucking friend somewhere, like battered in the general vicinity of her, for all of her bullshit powers to activate. Like that's the strategy when you fight her. It's just like, all right, I need to get all of her friends to a vacation. I need to set them up with good partners for life, get them a good house, make sure they're all happy and comfortable, and then I can kill the shit out of her because none of her bullshit friends will be motivation for her anymore. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was... I, I don't hate this chapter, actually, because it's, um, it's entirely unnecessary. There's no reason for Wendy to get this moment, but I, I guess I'm kind of glad she did because it felt like she didn't really do anything else and... If this is the ultimate arc of fairy tale, be kind of disappointed if her biggest claim to fame was she didn't actually get to be the one to sacrifice her magic. <laughs> but yeah, it is one of those things where you're just like, if that's all this existed for was just for Wendy to get her moment, I feel like there could have been some place else that would be better. Why not have found some way to make her the opponent that beat Lacarde at least? It'd be fucking more significant than Sting doing it. <laughs> and you can't tell me that Hero wasn't excited by the idea of Urz or fucking Wendy going up against puberty magic or whatever that dude had <sighs> so that's fairy tale a plus chapter this week i'm just gonna spoil you guys it's my chapter of the week <laughs> wendy's my character of people and wendy's mentality are my my mvp this week oh god all right, <laughs> let's move on to before shokugeki no soma chapter 198 exhaustion uh Let's just skip the first few pages because it's really exactly what you would expect. Uh, Saiba is missing. Uh, everyone is looking for him and they're panicking trying to find him because the blue is happening. Where could he be? Uh, yeah. There are There is a moment where like a couple of the people in the dorm are like, what if he is shooting himself in the head or committing harakiri? It's like, whatever, guys. <laughs> Calm down. Uh, I like the title page that we do get this week of uh, Dojima and Saiba celebrating with big old medals together. Uh, it's like, oh, a reminder of the happier times. Uh, after we get a few more pages of people running around trying to search for him, um, Dojima is thinking to himself as he's searching, I, like, I understand now, oh, those weird mashups he made were your way of letting off steam, because no matter how high you climbed, everyone pushed you to go even higher. 
the pressing weight of the duty you felt to meet those expectations, the backbreaking effort you put into everything, the soul crushing exhaustion it left you with. What did you get for it? People discounted it all because you were seen as gifted. Those mashups were your way of acting out against those who only ever cared about your results. But lately you've been so pressured and so stressed, you've lost that precious time to indulge in that little bit of rebellion. Looking back on it now, when was the last time I saw you smile? Truly smile from the heart while cooking. And uh, then he actually, thinking about that, remembers, oh, back then, and he goes to uh, the main uh, competition hall in order to find him. And uh, Saiba is sitting in this big arena, uh, completely alone in the darkness, when Dojima comes in and sits next to him. And uh, he looks down at his watch, he's like, yeah, everyone's worried about you, but there's no way you're going to be able to get to the blue in time, so... Yeah, no point in worrying over it. Uh, and Joitro apparently wasn't even thinking about it at all. He was just like, oh, yeah, that's going on. And what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, what up? <laughs> um, he says, I've always loved hanging out here in the Heaven's Moon Arena. It brings back memories, doesn't it? Remember that one time? You and me in the Fall Classic Finals. That was a blast. I don't know why, but last night I suddenly really wanted to come here. I'm feeling really stressed out. And, uh, yeah, I guess the blue, yeah, I got a produce results in that. I should get ready for tomorrow. Didn't have much time to sleep, so I went to the kitchen. Gotta go to work and figure out what my next goal is and get going on that, too. And the cut to... just broke. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we cut to a mental image of, you know, him stumbling through the, the desert or whatever. And, yeah, his his leg is now broken and he's dragging it along behind him as he's just like I have to keep on going forward and uh, he says "I it just hit me that I didn't know what I was doing I didn't know where I was or where I was going everything just didn't make sense and the narration goes living as a chef is like wandering through a storm ravaged wasteland like, yes I got that <laughs> <laughs> we got it last week guys we got that it's okay <laughs> But, uh, you know, did you just think to himself, you know, we called him Shura, but he wasn't a demon. He never was. He was just another high school kid with as warm and fragile a heart as any other. Somehow, somewhere, even I forgot that much. And it's our fault for leaving you to push on alone. He starts to cry because he feels like he's failed his friend. When, uh, at that moment, Senzemon, uh, the dean, comes in. Apparently, Senzaemon is like, ah, oh, swallowed by the storm. Has everyone just like, has everyone who's ever been under stress has experienced the exact same mental image? It's like, no, I've just been comparing everything with storm metaphors today. But, but my tongue on my coffee this morning was like, oh, it's like a lava explosion into this sandstorm is happening in my mouth. <laughs> So, I'm sleeping on the couch tonight. And... Oh, I accidentally <laughs> taped over Golden Girls this week. It's just like as if a hurricane had ripped a tree from the ground and replaced it with a shitty shrub or something. <laughs> Not unlike the episode of Golden Girls where a hurricane had taken down the lighthouse, so Rose starts up a charity drive, but Blanche uses it all the phone calls to pick up men. Oh, 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 oh Blanche, Blanche such a whore. She's such a whore. <laughs> yeah, see, he, he doesn't actually just compare everything to the storm. He just plays seven degrees of Kevin Bacon to compare everything to the Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Treetro, you sure look sad, don't you? <laughs> Unlike Stanley, Dorothy's ex husband from the Golden Girls. Oh, he was a real shit heel, that Stanley. <laughs> Never turn his things around until season seven. <laughs> then he finally became a man worth respecting. But by the Where are you going? <laughs> I haven't even brought up Leslie Nielsen yet. <laughs> oh god. Oh. I'm so confused as to what's happening in this podcast. Oh boy. So Sinzemon tells you each row that uh, he should go away for a while, leave the country, and spend time away from cooking and the kitchen. That's what you need most. And uh, we got time skip, and uh, yeah, 
said someone uh, Saiba does that he you know, packs up and he leaves the academy and you know and just kind of tells uh, Dojima and uh, Azami as he leaves sorry and uh, Dojima thinks to himself he smiled that same bright irreverent smile he'd give when he flaked out and promised to get together and that was the last time I saw Juichiro Saiba as a student and uh, the chapter ends with uh, presumably the end of the flashback and uh I like the brief little glimpse we get of Dojima and Azami standing there together. You know, Dojima understands what's going on, so he you know, kind of has this sort of deliberately passive look on his face, but Azami's eyes are hidden in shadow because he's got his face lowered. Uh, the beginnings of his turn to the dark side, I guess. Next week, he raises up his eyes, so he's like, I hate the Golden Girls. And that's <laughs> my most hated villain of all time. I'm like, kill him! <laughs> Rip his balls off! <laughs> Betty White's never been anything good. <laughs> <gasps> so, yeah, that's the end of the flashback. Kind of, I mean, it basically ended the way that you would expect it to, honestly. Um, no, no real surprises in this chapter from what led up to this point. I do think that mm. the, 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 the flashback had its point, and I, I do ultimately like kind of the way it ends with showing, like, one, they, they mentioned, like, Jiritro isn't, like, some promised one. Like, he mm -hmm. was a kid, he was a teen, but it's still a kid who was good, but we put way too much pressure on him. And like many other things, you know, he burned out. Like, the pressure was too much yeah. for him, so he just fucking booked it. And this... This does go to explain why Azami is kind of the way he is, you know. It, it it does kind of show that he was somebody who had this great respect for someone he revered, and that person crumbled. Didn't didn't understand. He probably also didn't understand the stress that Azami was, uh, the Saiba rather was under. Mm -hmm. So I can so. I can see where all these pieces come in. I still don't like the only reason I feel like we're getting this story is because Jiritro showed back up into the story to mm -hmm. really, like kind of raise the the interest in it, but. You know, it still works for the most part. It's not, you know, a, a character who I'm like, thank God we got his details and explanation. But overall, I'm still like, all right, you know, cool, fair enough. I think it was a, I think it was a, a necessary uh, story to tell mm -hmm. for what we're we've got going on, not just for to explain the what, the gulf that now separates uh, Joichiro from Azami, but also to explain, you know, this is where Azami got the inspiration for what he believes to be the ideal way that a, a student at the Academy should be like, um, and either not caring for the peep for what that does to their psyche or not understanding it. Uh, because, you know, as, presumably Azami wants students to follow the path that, that Saiba was on. Uh, but you know, that, that path broke Saiba. And he had to go away and goof off in order to not completely crumble. Uh, and Soma is someone who has been raised with that mindset for cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that Saiba developed afterwards. So. Yeah. I think that. Uh, I'll, I think I'll appreciate it more later down the road when we're yeah. getting. But I'm kind of eager to get back into Food Wars as a whole, you know, mm -hmm. series proper. Right, let's talk about Black Clover. Page 93, The Promised World. Are we, uh, did we do The Promised Neverland before Black Clover? Do it, I've for completely forgotten what our order is. Well, we can do either way. I. It is The Promised Neverland first. Burp, 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 burp. All right. Promised World was... <laughs> See, like, Annalise is in the chat like, Oh, I already screamed Black Clover into the chat. Promised World was code for we're actually talking about the Promised Neverland. Yeah, that's how it works, guys. Yeah, that's yeah. Chapter 22, bait. <laughs> the Promised Neverland, Chapter 22, in very tiny Black places, Clover. <laughs> Black Clover, bait. Or Black Spade or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we open up with a planning session between the main five kids uh, with Ray, you know, telling them, okay, here's what we're doing. Uh, I will distract mom when we've got our free time after lunch. Norman and Emma will climb the wall and inspect the vicinity 
Don and Gilda will be an in-between. They'll be watching the south window of the second floor of the house. So, you know, if I can't distract mom, they'll see her. They can signal Emma and Norman, and then they can cancel the inspection. It's a pretty straightforward plan as far as this series goes, I would say. <laughs> it's not too complicated. Uh, but Ray says, you know, there is a possibility that she won't fall for my distraction. So just just be aware that that is a, a, a clear possibility. Also, he they're doing this, like, gathering water chore while they're planning this. So there's a point, because they've all got buckets, there's a point where Ray, you know, dramatically is making gestures with the bucket that he's carrying <laughs> with a serious look on his face. It's a very bizarre visual. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um... The thing that he warns them about is this is all over if mom considers us to be uncontrollable. Uh, her current objective is to ship us out when we're mature, especially the three with perfect scores. So if she thinks that we can be controlled, she'll keep up with that. And there's no regular shipment next month, so she won't rush anything as long as she thinks that everything's fine. So we can't tip off well, what we're up to. Uh, the main three split off from Don and Gilda to discuss the fact that Crone found out that they know about the tracking devices. And Norman's like, yeah, we uh, kind of screwed up, so I, we should, I think, move up the escape. When can you actually break the tracking devices? I should point out that uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we got another one of the countdowns with the date, uh, and it said six days. So I feel as though they might not actually move up the escape date. <laughs> from what goes on here and we might get in a we might get uh uh an explanation as to why by the end of this chapter we'll see uh ray takes out a box that has a, a camera in it one of the kind of polaroid cameras that uh, prints out a picture immediately um and uh, he says you know this is what i was waiting for it's the last reward that i got from uh, mom and this is the last necessary piece with it i can break the tracking devices at any time so uh if we can inspect the vicinity sure let's move up the escape date it's dependent on how well the that goes nick i need all of you you're the smart one in this team nick i'm just i'm the, I'm the looks all right <laughs> so how does a, a an instant camera as they're calling it get rid of the tracking device uh, I don't know. <laughs> but Nick, you're the one with the high score in the sea of special intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> intelligent. <laughs> yeah, intelligence. <laughs> you just take the I N T E L L E. <laughs> oh, okay. No, see, it's the E in special. You take out. The first two E's. <laughs> it's the last E. It's the last one. Every other letter. <laughs> uh, well, if it's an instant camera, it probably has something to do with the actual picture development uh, mechanism within the camera. I have no idea how these things actually work. Uh, so, But if it's got to be an instant camera, then that would probably have to be it, the way it develops the picture. The picture. I feel like whatever they, however they're going to do it is going to blow my mind, because I'll be completely honest, I'm still not entirely certain how VCRs worked. <laughs> like, I'm like, how did they actually take what's on the screen and put it on film? How did that work? <laughs> Was there a little man inside drawing it? <laughs> oh, God. I never fed my man. Was that illegal? I always thought that the way that they did it in the, in the Flintstones was actually reality. More than... <laughs> <laughs> like a brontosaurus head lifted itself out of my VCR every so often, like, eh, it's a living. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart steals Tiny Toons <laughs> how I spent my summer vacation a lot, though. God. Shut up and you tape that so I don't have to stop renting it from Blockbuster. <laughs> oh, boy. So, Norman... Uh, Things to himself as they're breaking uh, the meeting. It's like, yeah, you know, this it's this kind of a nuisance because Ray's method of nullifying the tracking devices is the evidence that indicates our rebellion. If we do break them, then we can't go back from that. Um. So yeah, they they just kind of have a quick little power. Like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do this before we're gonna finish our inspection, escape as soon as possible before that we, we give away any evidence to Crowan or anyone else. 
Uh, we cut over to Crone, who is thinking to herself as she's going about doing her chores around the place. Like, okay, let's see here. They know how to break the tracking devices, but they didn't. But they pretend otherwise. Why did they do that? How did they figure out how to break them? How are they going to break them? Are they going to use a tool? Did they make a tool? Maybe I could find that tool that they have then. And so she starts searching around the bedrooms, and we see Phil going around like, do 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 do. What are you doing? And he's like, nothing. There is a wonderful image of Crone looking around the room because it makes her look like Asura. <laughs> Like just uh, uh, jer jerking her head all around the place and her yeah. wild hair flipping around her head as she does so. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just so striking in the way that she's twisting her lips up in concentration as she does so too. Ugh. So, uh, we get a brief explanation. Ray is actually hidden all of his rewards underneath uh, one of the other kids' nightstands. So it's going to be very difficult for Crone to just find it on a random inspection unless she tears up the every last inch of the floor. Um, but also, Ray has laid out bait for her. And uh, Crone finds the bait behind uh, a shelf somewhere. And uh, Emma and, and Norm don't know what it is. But, uh, you know, Crone looks at it and is like, why didn't I notice this? If this is true, it would mean it's just this note that's got, that's got this uh, writing eye that we can't actually read. And Crone's like, wait, if I, if I appeal to Grandma or someone by showing them this note, I can make everyone lose trust in his bell, uh, in his bell completely. Ah, but I've got to find out if this is true or not. I've got to verify it myself. And uh, she uh, goes, I can't figure out exactly where she is. I don't know. She goes into another room somewhere. I think that she's in the hidden office, but I'm not sure. Um, but she's, you know, searching through stuff to get verification, and she seems to find it, and she's like, it's true. It's really true. It's Queen Isabella's second weakness. And how should I go about this? If things go well, I can oust Isabella first and obtain the mom position, and then I can ship out the rebellious ch children unconditionally. And this time, I have this note as physical evidence. And then she's like, what does Ray know about this? Did Isabella tell him? She's like um, in the middle of her own Team Rocket-esque like vision of what's going to happen after they succeed. Like it's yeah. only one step away from her like at a, at a pool with like a, a fucking fan like on her as like mom's like a fucking like stupid servant next to her or something like that. Like she's It's she's a really weird thing because she's body. thinking... It's a weird thing because she's, you know, she even says to herself, like, I can ship out the children first, you know, unconditionally. But, and it's like, you can see a cage got, with is, the other kids in it. Like, they're crying in the cage. Well, most of them are crying. Ray is just kind of like, well, like, here we are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this seems like what would happen. Yeah, yeah. I figured this would happen after we. She's got, she's got Isabella on the ground with her foot in her chest, like, ah! <laughs> So just as she's kind of starting to grow suspicious, like, how the fuck did Ray find out about this? Hmm. And Isabella shouldn't even know about this in the first place. So, But she hears uh, the door opening, so she quickly stows away the note in, in the pocket of her apron and closes up the suitcase that she was scrounging through and then opens the door. I love the way that it's drawn because, you know, so many times in the last few chapters we've seen Crone drawn this weird... Uh, kind of monstrous, intimidating way. And then in, from her point of view, we see Isabella just coming out of the shadows, looking very calm and yet still very intimidating. And then the next page, which you have to turn in order to get, we see that she's holding a knife behind her back. And Crone freaks out as she whips it from behind her back in front of her. But it turns out she's just offering her a letter opener together with a, with a sealed envelope. I, I'm actually really glad they ended the chapter with that instead, because it was going to be like, I didn't buy for a second that no. mom was just going to fucking kill no, her with, no like, way. far and away, like, one of the least productive ways to stab someone to death, like, with a letter Letter opener. openers are quite blunt for what they do. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've been stabbed 96 times by a letter <laughs> opener. I may die soon. She fell on her letter opener. She fell on her letter opener 500,000 times. <laughs> she fell on a letter opener. 
down a flight of stairs <laughs> into a washing machine. With a loaded gun inside. <laughs> she may have swallowed some poison. I don't know. <laughs> I guess what happened is there's no big, there's no, there's no culprit suspected right now. And we should all just forget she exists. <laughs> Like, I thought mom was so much better at this. <laughs> She's really sloppy. And then, and apparently in her last moments, she wrote out in her own blood, mom did it. <laughs> her last moments, she wrote out she in sad. my handwriting, I don't want any autopsies. <laughs> Thus closing the book on this mystery. <laughs> She was probably just hysterical from the first 54 stab wounds. <laughs> Why did she sign your name, Mom? <laughs> no, that's... It's, that's no, a see, if that's you flip it upside down and put it in a mirror and then jumble the words closer together, you'll see that it sort of looks like Crone. <laughs> no, it still kind of looks like Isabella. Look. <laughs> Phil, come here and hold this letter opener for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then go into this washing machine after falling down these stairs. <laughs> These stupid kids will never believe me. Oh, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just put down best original WMR original character bad at her job, mom. <laughs> mom who just gave up. <laughs> oh god. Um so I don't know exactly um how Isabella knows what the letter is because it's got you know, it's sealed with like a seal. Uh, yeah. That old school letters have, but she knows what it is. Then she gives it to Cron, who opens it up, and she's like, "What is this?" And Isabel's like, "Yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's how it is." Goodbye. It's, so she already knows what it is. So I guess that this is what she was, you know, doing at the end of the last chapter. What her plan that she was setting in the motion was, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit of a weird thing where it's just like, "I know what that is," even though it's sealed. <laughs> Yeah, but I guess I have to imagine that mom's not really playing coy on this, and it's probably going to be pretty obvious that she had a, a hand to play in what's happening here. I maybe don't know. she maybe she just disgusted with them. Yeah, like or she faked it. Who knows? Yeah, but yeah, she mentioned like I'm moving a plan up, so she must have probably had some way of actually, you know, some influence on this happening now, and I think. I'm assuming that what's probably happening is like, hey, you're being reassigned. So all the work that Crone's just done is going to be undone. And essentially Crone's filled her purpose of being a distraction for the rest of the kids for a couple. Because remember, the next time we were supposed, they were supposed to talk to Crone, she was going to reveal all about fucking Gooselglorp or whatever his name is. So mm -hmm. it's going to either she's dying or she's getting sent away. Because I, I feel like that's something they don't want to reveal quite yet. I get the feeling that... Uh, she will probably try to take immediate action in response to this because she's like, I've got the evidence. And uh, her having to rush before she can confirm certain details will probably be her undoing. Mm. And yeah, I, I like that idea that, you know, this is what's going to prevent them from finding out more about the world is that their link to it is suddenly disappeared. So, yeah. All right. Now we'll do Black Clover. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Page 93, The Promised World. So, uh, Fauna is now engaging Asta and Mars. She's freaking out as the eye seems to, you know, just be taking almost full control of her as they rush in. Mars and Asta are both able to evade her magic because, you know, Asta's got his cleaver and Mars, I guess, just has, you know, matching flames so he can repel it. Uh, oh, he's actually using his crystal magic to do that. Uh, so they're like, all right, we're getting close, we're we can get her, and suddenly both of them just erupt into flame. Uh, very suddenly, because the heat surrounding Fauna is just so ridiculously powerful that it's it's incinerating them, even as they try to approach her. But uh, fortunately, uh, Mars has his own flame magic, and he turns that into recovery magic so that it, it heals them. It's kind of like that, you know, Wolverine in X3 kind of moment where he's like, ah, oh, it's peeling me oh. away, but my regeneration lets me get closer anyway. Ah. I mean, garbage movie. That was a pretty dope movie. That was pretty moment, though. Yes. But yeah, absolutely horrible movie. Why did fucking Shadowcat fight Juggernaut and Colossus did nothing that movie but throw Wolverine once? 
I'm the juggernaut, and I play by a guy who's not actually an actor, but was was like a rugby. Was he soccer player? <laughs> rugby player, I believe. Nathan Jones, rugby, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the juggernaut. I'm an I. Vincent Jones, I believe. Vinny you Vincent. never, you never believe that I'm Professor X's half brother. You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, you're almost as tall as Patrick Stewart is. <laughs> really thought you'd go for a big juggernaut, <laughs> not one that like. They're like, Ellen, can you not wear heels? You're you're starting to tower over a juggernaut in this scene. <laughs> They're like, hey, but hey, we got the I'm a juggernaut bitch meme in there, so internet props? They're like, no, that sucked. That was terrible. <laughs> but I like Vinnie Jones. I'm not shading on Vinnie Jones. I'm shading on Vinnie Jones as the juggernaut. Alright? I love Liam What's Neeson. What's up with a mutant in this movie? Even though I'm technically not. <laughs> Even though it's very much the contrary of my character. It's actually a very complicated backstory, though, so if they were going to introduce me, this probably best not to oh, have the gem that grants me superpowers. It's very Ancient complicated. Gone. <laughs> I cocked it all up, they did, Governor. Anyways, off to my dinner with the Queen. Pip, pip, everybody. And he drives <laughs> off. Your accent's car. changing with every scene, it is. <laughs> oh, I'm a pirate now. Yarr! <laughs> Vinnie anyway. Jones, everybody. <laughs> all the way. Nick, I'm back. Did I miss Vinnie Jones? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, man, that impression was so completely... <laughs> <laughs> it's so flawless. <laughs> you have Gav shouting at us after this. <laughs> oh, it was so my best friend you did. <laughs> oh, God. Time to make my Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cross the boss in the chat for that. Oh, God. Um, there's a scene of Mars admiring Asta. I'm not going to dwell on it because it'll make me angry. Uh, like, what a sweet bot. Yeah. He's so smart. <laughs> in fairness, Asta does the same thing to Mars. He's like, oh, man, this guy's you know, got, got incredible st stamina to save somebody. He's great. So, okay. But it's like, eh, someone recognizing Asta. I'm just going to pan over that. Uh, Fanzel turns to, I really hate this honestly, turns to Noel and Finral and Vanessa and is like, you guys should evacuate. And they're just staring in determination back. And, and Fanzel's is like, yeah, I'll believe in those two as well and see this through. Okay, guys, it's great that you believe in Asta. Like you super believe in him and stuff. You have no reason to be there, though. It's like one of you can teleport you guys like 600 feet back. You can all still stay there, like staring forward in support. It's and then just, come right back nuke, once they're she done. She's a nuke right now. I mean, like, it is dangerous. Even if they're going to be fine and they end up succeeding, fire might still go off and strike. You probably should leave if you're not going to contribute to this. Okay? No, we believe in us. Okay, for fuck's sake. Right, That's what you're there. Fair enough. That's, I like to think that somewhere I'm, out there, there's like the dark parody of, of uh, World Trigger, or not World Trigger, Black Clover, where like fucking Noel walks into a store and like kicks a cop in the face and like steals a hundred candy bars. And like, what do you think you're doing? Like, believing in Asta and just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and like in that world, Asta is like some horrifying like dark cult or something. <laughs> Oh, you God. can't run seven red lights in a row? Yes, I can, because I believe in Asta. So, Mars continues to push closer, reaches towards Fauna, who shouts out, It's over! Which, I don't know exactly what she was going to do, because all we see next is Asta saying, No, it's not! And he swings his cleaver, and he splits something? Strikes a dragon head? I'm not sure what he does, but he seems to just part the flame surrounding them so that Mars can finally reach her. I, I assume he strikes Salamander, which is I'm not, her spirit. I really don't know what the hell is going on. It's it's hard to tell because they're moving through the flames that are surrounding Fauna. And I I get well, okay, the flame, so they're the at the flames are surrounding the, her. I think they're at the edge of the flames and Mars is trying to reach through them. I think that's what's going yeah, he's on. He's trying to get through, and it looks like Asta, I guess, cuts the flames in that. Dissolve. To make a path for him to go through. I Yeah, okay. It took me a couple of read-throughs in order to get... All right, there we go. Nick's like, all um, right, I turned to... I love Black Clover now. <laughs> that was what I needed. 
Fauna, you know, is, you know, kind of ranting to herself. It won't disappear. Our hatred won't disappear. The Mars rushes in and hugs her tightly and says, it's me. I'm sorry. Because back then I didn't have the strength to fight alongside you. So please forgive me. And all the memories come rushing back into Fauna. And Mars says, we've met in the outside world, but we haven't begun yet. Let's go see the world together. And the eye on Fauna's head peels away, disappears, and she gives him a smile and says, it's a promise, Mars. And he starts to cry as they embrace, and that's the end of the chapter. I was disappointed by this whole sequence. Um, like, it's not a problem with the chapter itself, because in a, in a, like, in a nutshell, uh, if the chapters leading up to this point, if I liked them better, I think that I would really like this moment. I think that on its own, it it would work well in a better context. But the the real lack of buildup, it feels like this moment has gotten with uh, the sudden rush of Mars turned good after that first confrontation with Asta, which we found out last chapter. Um, just the general feeling that a lot of the moments in this whole arc are just echoes of the last one. Uh, and the fact that most of the characters involved in this arc weren't there to do anything. When you get down to it, the important people on the hero side were Asta and Fanzel and then Mars. We did have, you know, the moment, of course, of Asta working together with Vanessa and Fenrir again. We had Noelle showing that she has improved her, her sea dragon uh, attack. But then at the end, they're just kind of standing there and it feels like they hadn't had their chance to shine before that to justify. But we're standing here believing in Asta now and that's all we're doing. So it's this arc, it seems to, you know, be pretty much it, it's reached its climax now because the two main opponents that were introduced in this have been neutralized. One making amends with Mars, one, I guess, being dead. Uh, I guess the Latras is gone. Uh, so, I mean, like, I, I really have not liked this arc. Uh, this this chapter, I think, is fine. Uh, and I admit that if I liked the stuff up, being up to it, I would probably really like it. But as is, just no. What was the point of, like, the conflict, like, between the Diamond Kingdom and, and Fauna and the Midnight I don't Sun? know. I don't know what they were, were they there trying for. Trying to apprehend Fauna because she was from the Diamond Kingdom, I guess. Then, right? That's true. Was it to apprehend her, or well, did they I don't just know. meet by coincidence? Maybe Mars knows, and he's going to explain uh, after this. Because I know the the rest of the cast were there because of the Witch's Forest, right? Which but it of... seemed like it was just a coincidence that the two were confronting each other. And they did seem to be wanting to get into the forest, and I. I think that there might have been a passing mention that they wanted something inside the forest. So I'm not sure if there was something that they heard about or what. Oh, okay. I feel like I'm missing a couple details, but I probably just wasn't paying enough attention for it. I don't think that the, I don't think that the I don't think the Diamond Kingdom and Midnight Sun were actually fighting against each other. I mean, they they displayed them as though they were. Like there was that one scene where like they were they like side by side against each other and like I talking don't, shit about one another. I don't think that they were actually there to fight each other though. It wasn't like, so it's like just coincidence. They both ran into each other at the same time. Presumably, presumably they had a shared, not a shared objective, but they wanted the same thing to have to be inside the forest. I mean, they did establish as like, okay, you know, that they you know, the queen is a very powerful witch. So it could just be that they wanted to, you know, abduct her. Uh, or it might have been like that they had uh, some sort of they learned of something valuable in the forest, which is entirely possible. So, okay, fair enough. I, I I'm still trying to grasp everything that was on there. Um, no, I mean it's it, yeah. The, I enjoyed this, I suppose, just because I didn't need to read the black, you know, light novel to know what was happening here. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so I could grasp all this, but yeah, by and large, you know, it, it's it was fine. Okay. That's my thought. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Exclamation point. Percent sign. 
Okay. Oh, All right. Shit. All right. So I had to do Ruby, right? Ruby. Ruby. We're out of 10. we're out of the trailers. Yeah, which is a shame because I barely remember reading this chapter. It'd be really easy if it was based off another trailer because then I'd just be like, oh, yeah, it was a bunch of action shit you couldn't see because it's <laughs> all fucking drawn now. And uh, so yeah, we're out of the trailers and we're into, I guess what is. I don't know if this is original content or net or not yet, but it, it it's at least following Team Juniper, so it follows something that happens after episode fucking one of Ruby. Uh, I don't know. You you watched further into it than I did at this point. So it would be after. Happens. It would presumably be after episode eight. Yeah, but, I don't uh, know if this is an adventure they did on. It's the not in the. It's not in the first season. I'll tell you. I I know that much. Okay, so they're talking about how. Team Juniper is a team of characters who, if you were only reading this manga, by the way, you're going to be like, who the no fuck are these people? Who any of them are. Because, <laughs> like, John and Pira are, you know, important supporting characters. Like, John gets, like, his own episode, his own set of episodes at one point, and he's, you know... He's basically, like, the most important character aside from the main four. But to this point, like, you have no idea who he is, so, you know... The first time you see him is he's like crying and drooling while slouched over. <laughs> that's the first look at him you get. I mean, that's essentially what you get in the anime I mean, too. Yeah. Or whatever you call it, he's like vomiting on airship. Uh, they're 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 hunting down a grim, and as you mentioned, John is a fucking like a dude <laughs> stare at you. Like you are an enormous liability everywhere. You, you're like Osamu, but with no respect for yourself. <laughs> Which is a goddamn shame. And uh, oh, God. the statuesque, attractive blonde or uh, redhead is, of course, like, don't worry, I believe in you. You've shown me no positive attitude for the fucking qualities of yourself, but I have a crush on you. Uh, it's just, or we're something. Team Juniper, we can do it. Uh, we then, I guess, cut over to Team Ruby, talking about how, I guess, they're angry that Team Juniper left without them. God, what the fuck is this series, Nick? I'm... I'm reading it again in the moment, and I'm like, they're angry because Team Juniper left. Then we cut away to the fucking hat cane dude, who's like, Yeah, it looks like it's collected. Good, good, good. Here's tunnel leads into the Glen Mountain Glen. That'd be perfect. Hmm? Did something move? Ah, an octopus. I'll shoot up my cane gun. Kablamo, kill it. Ah, good thing, I th good I thing th everything everyone cares and carries in this series turns into another weapon. <laughs> good Thank God everything that I have is a gun. <laughs> I think oh I... no! The, oh no! The cane gun was ineffective. Quick, hand me that scythe sniper rifle. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! We're all going to die. I'll just take out my shoe woozies and get us out of this situation. <laughs> shoe woozies. I'll, I'll toss a couple sock grenades. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you throw your hat like Aja? What are you talking about? Hats are just hats. You're crazy. What the he just shoots him in the face. Don't you fucking... You fuck with the sanctity of hats. <laughs> Takes off his ass god and turns it into a whip. <laughs> it's like the, the soul caliber, like, ivy scythe whip thing. He's like, if our hats were something else, they couldn't be hats, stupid. <laughs> That's the most ridiculously uninformed thing I've ever heard. Now the ribbon I keep on the hat. <laughs> if you weren't my brother slash Tyrannosaurus Rex, I'd kill you right now. <laughs> now the ribbon on the hat. That turns into a flamethrower. Oh, that's a pool. <laughs> and microwave up. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, he's... They basically, they had, like, a little fucking uh, octopus-looking Grim come out. I don't know if it's supposed to be, like, Cthulhu-oriented or if it's just an octopus. Mm -hmm. They just mentioned, like, Ew, it's kind of gross. And uh, Torchwick, I think is the guy's name, says, uh, well, I think I read about it, though. Any loose Grim is unsafe. But this one, you definitely don't just want roaming about. That's the chapter. Which is like, what was this chapter? It was two pages of Team Juniper looking lame. Two this... pages of Team Ruby being like, why didn't we get to go? And then Torchwick <laughs> being like, did you see that thing? It's clear that uh, this manga is has got to be... I think that we Burned. can clearly draw the conclusion at this point that this manga is 
not intended to actually introduce anyone into Ruby because it's, you would have no idea anything that's going on because you jump between these four characters with no connection between the stories that they had. And then you go right into this and they're like, wait, they were a team the whole time? Who is this other team? Who is this guy with the hat and the cane that I haven't seen at all before? What are these grim? What's going on? You know, because I have no idea. I know I know who these characters are and I don't know what the fuck they're up to. Where is Team Juniper going? Yeah, like, <laughs> are they hunting this Grim that Torchwick found? Exactly. Are these supposed to be connected? Is that are they headed towards the same location because of this Grim? Also, I just want to point out. You know how, <laughs> you know how Yuno is on is it listed among the characters in every, in pretty much every chapter of Black Clover, even when he's not there. If you look at the character roster in Ruby, Junior's <laughs> on there. The gangster Yang was fighting in the last chapter. He's <laughs> done. <laughs> They're like, guys, just as we move on, just keep in mind, at any moment, Junior is going to be relevant again. <laughs> Junior is the most important character. <laughs> Complete inversion of Rebecca. Every, every time something dramatic happens, like it's a mystery in, in Ruby, I want everyone to just find the ways to make a bullshit theory that it's all about Junior. <laughs> like, everyone's like... All right, so we don't know why that Grim popped out of it, but what if Junior released it? Then? <laughs> <laughs> this is all about that. Oh God. Yeah. Um. Why the fuck are we reading this? Stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Because we did a bonus episode on Ruby, and we have to follow through now. I, think I might as well just read it, I guess. <laughs> you know what? My most novel like takeaway from this chapter, I was like. You know, if they ever made a live-action Ruby, they should just get the guy who plays Captain Cold and Flash to pay Torchwick, because he's just... I feel like he's just as campy and fey as Torchwick would be. So he walks into places like, Hmm, let's bust this place up, see? Okay. All right, so let's cap things off with One Piece, Chapter 852, Germa's Failure. Uh... What is this? Hang on a second. What is this asterisk going towards? Yeah, I couldn't figure out where it was. What is being from? asterisk here? Because there is the message, you've done a terrible thing. Uh, I couldn't tell. I, I didn't know exactly. Maybe that's for Hidoi Kotosurua? I don't know. Maybe it's just commenting on that painting. Uh, for the prompt, it's like, how dare you prompt me this idea, which I spent hours drawing. <laughs> well, I just spent the actual painting of uh, Chopper inside oh, of it. Oh, okay. Well, no, he looks happy about it. He's eating cotton candy. He doesn't fucking give a shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be here to approve of this of a, of this unauthorized image of myself if you hadn't given me candy. <laughs> you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you distracted me with candy again. But this has worked. Do as you will. <laughs> uh, we uh, begin in the medical room on Whole Cake Chateau, where uh, Reiju is uh, waking up uh, from the ordeal that she's been through. And of course, she doesn't remember anything. Uh, you know, there are attendants who are there, and it's like, oh, you know, there was uh, apparently, uh, you know, uh, yeah, this is what happened, apparently. Um, uh, Sanji uh, sends them off, basically. Um, and uh, they're going to be reported like, okay, you know, we're going to be holding her here overnight while she recovers. Uh, we'll tell them what's the other Vince Smokes, what's going on. Uh, Reiju starts talking with Sanji, and she's like, she's obviously surprised to see him there. And then she's like, oh, yeah, I was walking around the castle, and then I came across some sh soldiers shouting about an infiltrator, and then I guess I got attacked. Uh, oh, that's what happens. God, I could not. Com I actually completely miss what the fuck was going on. So, here's what actually happens after I completely botched explaining <laughs> it the first time because I didn't understand. It. I'm sorry. The medical people are overseeing Reiju. They go to report to the Vince Smokes. They're like, "We'll tell them this version of events." Da, 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 da. You see Sanji sneaking around the corner. Yes. He beats up the guards while Reiju is asleep and ties them up and gags them. And then he's there waiting while she wakes up. Okay. That makes infinite more sense. All right. Sorry. I must have just completely misinterpreted that from the first time I read it. Mm -hmm. Nick read it and he's just like, 
how does Junior play a part in all of this? <laughs> how is Junior really? Who tied up that guard? It must have been Junior. <laughs> or has Junior been the guard all along? <laughs> God damn it, that crafty bastard's one step ahead of me. Oh gosh. Yeah, Rachel's you know trying to trying to remember what's go what happened. She's like, I guess you know I came across soldiers that were shouting my tra an infiltrator, and then I think I got attacked. And Sanya says, Yeah, it doesn't all go together, does it? It doesn't feel like it all quite fits, and that's because your memories have been replaced. I'll tell you what really happened. <laughs> Wait a minute. It says Miss Peacock's the killer in this ending. All right, now we'll show you what really happened. I'm going to go home and have sex with my wife. Oh, oh 80s, you were homophobic. <laughs> I fucking love that ending, though. <laughs> That's a great line, I have to admit. And I'm going to go home and have sex with my wife. <laughs> and then shake, rattle, and roll. We got to the prison library where um, fire, fire everywhere. And uh, Luffy emerges from the, the flames and the lava. He's like, yeah, we're safe. And now he's like, Jesus Christ, why? Why? <laughs> And Jinbei says, yeah, I'm sorry, that was the only way that you could escape from Mondor's books, is by burning them. And Luffy's like, yeah, but it saved me from ripping my arms off. Yeah, e again, Luffy. <laughs> hey, you know what? Perspective, Nick. Hashtag blessed. Uh... They get a little bit nostalgic, because they say, like, oh, yeah, the first time we met would have been in prison, too. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they also observed that there were a, a ton of prisoners being held inside the book who have been let out, too. Uh, they didn't seem to deal with the lava too well, though, by comparison to Luffy and Nami. So. Uh, Jinbei basically says, yeah, my, you know, the Sun Pirates are affiliated with Big Mom's operation. And I mean, it's like, so is this guy your ally? No. And uh, Jimmy says, yes, this is rebellion. There's no turning back now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I forgot how much I miss Jimbe, honestly. Rebellion, precisely. There's no turning uh, back now. Uh, 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 uh. <sighs> and uh, Nami brings up, you said when we were on Fishman Island that you had a position that you had to uphold, and Jimmy's like, yep, you just saw me abandon it. <laughs> <laughs> right there, it's gone. That's it. <laughs> Boof. <laughs> I said I had some shit to be named, to need to be taken care of. Right there, it's been taken care of. It's gone. That, they... that was a bridge I had to go handle? Just lit that thing ablaze. Burned it now to I'm the ground. Now blaze up myself. They're like, stop, stop getting high. We need to finish this. Nah, I'm chilling out the rest of this arc. Uh, guards start to approach and Luffy collapses. He's like, oh, I feel hungry all of a sudden. And Jimmy's like, what, a time like this? Nami says, well, Luffy expends three times the energy of a normal person just by being alive and breathing. <laughs> so fed up with this shit. Um, Luffy, of course, you know, reestablishes. I still not got anything that's not prepared by Sanji. Uh, he gets ready to go off and save his friend because he, as he remembers that pudding saying, you know, Sanji proposed to me, I'm going to riddle him with bullets. That doesn't sound sexy at all. I don't think he would enjoy that. But hey, I, hope like, that is... word. <laughs> I hope they have a safe word. I hope they have a safe word. Actually pulls out, pulls out a gun kind of points at him. Pineapple, pineapple! <laughs> the safe word is shoot me more. That doesn't seem <laughs> like a good idea. Uh, Luffy rushes off on his own straight up the stairs um, into a bunch of guards because that's I guess Luffy can't run anywhere unless it's into trouble so yeah, yeah. yeah that's what he does yeah. we cut away as Nami is scolding Luffy he's like come on literally it was just this morning that you got in this situation because of that uh, we cut back to the medical room where Sanji has finished his explanation to Reiju, and uh, you know, he, he starts freaking out afterwards, you know, holding his head in his hands, saying, you know, I assumed if I accept the marriage, I could save Luffy and the others, but it turns out I was never in the cars to begin with. I thought I could just sacrifice myself and everything would be perfectly fine. What kind of fantasy world was I living in? And uh, Reiju says very calmly, you know, father was 
careless and arrogant about this, but in my opinion, it's timely, if anything. I believe that Germa, as it exists now, ought to be destroyed. So I'll just pretend I have no idea what's going on and let Big Mom's plan be carried out. And Sanji's like, but they're gonna kill you too. And Reiji says, what, you're worried about me? I mean, you know, look, this is the problem with lasting impressions. I do one little favor for you and you imagine you owe me some great debt over the years, so stop it. You know, join the Straw Hats, get away from here. And uh, it's a very emotional, important exchange that they have. And throughout all of it, you know, Reiju is almost stone-faced. Uh, talking about, you know, like, yeah, no, I'll just let us die. Like, oh, all right. No biggie. Yeah. Kind of a bummer. Hmm. And Sanji's going, I was like, okay, well, wait, what about the Barati? What about them? And Sanji says, look, worry about that after you're actually safe and away from here, because if you stay, then all of you are going to die. Uh, and she says, there is a memory in my head that I'll never forget. A huge fight between father and mother. And I only stood, understood what it meant much later. Because when you four boys were about to be born, she was steadfastly against turning you into emotionless machines. Uh, essentially, she was going to have to be undergoing an operation in order to actually make sure that the offspring would turn out all perfect and stuff. And uh, they end up forcing it upon her. Uh, against her will. But mother took pills in an attempt to halt father's mad ambitions. Powerful medicine, strong enough to affect the manipulated bloodline elements. And we see a brief glimpse in a flashback of her, like, lying on the ground, surrounded by blood. Uh, I don't know if they ever actually flat out say it, but I believe that this um, implies that the reason that she was sick was because she was trying to prevent the, this is what she did in order to try to prevent it. And she ended up falling ill because of it. Yes. Um, but as Rager says, you know, it wasn't enough. Uh, there were abnormalities in the boys' bodies, except for Sanji's, uh, who was, you know, essentially perfectly normal. Of course, as we found out, they waited, decided to wait and see with him at, until he started to get older. And then, he started to feed animals that needed it. And uh, they're like, oh, he's got emotions. He shouldn't have them. And uh, Rage says, yeah, the after effects of the poison were that she grew weaker and weaker, got more and more sick. And the fact is you did grow as a human being. And Sanji is shocked to learn this. And he's like, wait, so you mean it's because of me that she died? And Rage is like, don't take, don't take it that way. Don't you dare take it that way. She was truly happy over how you turned out, and she had no regrets with her decision. And she remembers time spent with her mother talking because, you know, her mom was sharing these happy thoughts. And, uh, you know, saying like, oh, Reiji, Sanji cooked lunch for me. And guess what Sanji told me today? He said, get better soon. He's so sweet. This all kind of does make sense, too, since Reiji would be the only other one of her kids that actually has emotions in that way. Mm -hmm. She wasn't... She was raised to be like the uh, the others, and I mean, her body was obviously modified, but she wasn't grown. And she wasn't like a test tube baby, essentially. Mm -hmm. She wasn't built from the ground up that way. Presumably, that's why she is number zero, is because uh, she was the guinea pig that led to uh, Ichiji and the others. Uh, she was what they were modeled after. And presumably why she's the only member of the family that seems to have any kind of affection for Sanji, mm -hmm. too. Their, her emotions are heavily suppressed because of her training and her upbringing and uh, modifications done to her, but yeah. Um, and of course, you know, she, she goes, you know, the father couldn't forgive this. He blamed you for everything that happened and started to mistreat you accordingly. And, you know, you're not a failure. Mother gave her life in resistance to protect you and the emotions you were born with, and that's what you stand for, Sanji. It's why you were born kinder and gentler than anyone. She starts to tear up as she finishes that. Uh, we cut around the island to a bunch of different places. Uh, we see Luffy fighting with a bunch of, uh, you know, mooks, including one giant looking dude. Uh, some of the generals are conversing and uh, one of them makes the decision. I forget her name. She is the, uh, smoothie, I think she's smoothie. Smoothie. <clears throat> she's, she makes the decision. Hey, um, if Mama hears about this, about the 
about our failures. It's going to have an effect on tomorrow's plan. So if this plan fails, we're kind of fucked. Um, you know, so do this, you know, make sure that she doesn't get wind about all this, shut this down immediately and you know, get to work. It, it, we might even have to, uh, to kill rather than capture just because that, that'll, that could end up being easier. So you have my permission to go with that. And uh, then back to the conversation between Sanji and Reiju, and Reiju says, look, abandon Jerma, leave leave everything behind. It's nothing more than a destructive force clinging to the glories of its past. The world doesn't need us. And all Big Mom wants is our scientific power. I doubt she has any interest in the life of your mentor. It's father and our brothers who are threatening to take that restaurant hostage, and they're the ones who will die tomorrow. It's exactly what we deserve. We're a band of murderers. And Sanji says, okay, yeah, I don't really care about them, but what about you? Why do you have to die? And Rage says, I do have my emotions, but Father had me augmented into an accomplice who cannot disobey his orders. My hands are stained with blood. I deserve death. By the way, those bracelets up on you, uh, I switched them out for ordinary ones. They're not going to explode. Your hands aren't going to blow off. So is there any other reason for you to be here? You know, get it together. Look at what really matters to you. You have those wonderful friends and you're never going to meet people like them again. And that's where the chapter ends. Um, yeah. So that was kind of a ride. There's a lot to this chapter. Um, mm -hmm. it, it gave us a little bit more context into Sanji's backstory and does kind of add a bit more humanity to judge. He's not as evil as expected. Mm -hmm. I mean, still an awful person, but Seeing Keep... that it was the death of his wife that kind of, and the death that he blamed because she basically used those drugs, Sanji being the byproduct of that, why he kind of then turned his aggression towards him. You know, it's not, I'm not absolving him of it. He's a shithead, but mm -hmm. it's not reasonless hatred. There's something there that makes you say like, oh, okay, like I can see where this kind of came from. And maybe, maybe there's a chance there could still be kind of a, a small sort of redemption for them. Um... But, yeah, just a lot of emotion to this chapter. Um, and I, I'm i kind of waiting to see. It sounds like they're kind of almost building up the idea that Sanji's going to come out of this and find a way to save everyone in Jerma. Um, that's what I'm kind of hoping for. Well, you know, they established this. You know, that's what makes you kinder than anyone. So what would someone of endless kindness do? You would want to try and save everybody. Yeah. So... So I can I can definitely see him at least trying to do that, um, and I I get I I do definitely believe that we're not just going to get uh, the Vince Smokes just like well they're gone now. I, it, it definitely feels like Judge and uh, Sanji's siblings have been built up too much at this point for them to just so easily be discarded. It seems like there's a lot more that can be done with them. Um. I mean, I'm not sure exactly where where we're going to go with this, but this was definitely, I think, this feels like it's uh, the emotional climax of the story. You know, this big breakthrough for Sanji, uh, where we get a lot of closure uh, in you know what we learned about him through his backstory and his relation to his family. Uh, you know, he's not just the runt of the litter. He is, you know, more he is special because he is different from them. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, an effective chapter, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Although with, it's off next week, which mm -hmm. is a pretty big bummer. Yep. So that's going to do it for Weekly Manga Recap this week, guys. <clears throat> so uh, let's decide on our favorites for this week. Favorite series and MVP. I'm having a hard time picking this. Can I this. give my favorite chapter of the week to welcome to the ballroom? <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to go with, uh, with one piece for my chapter of the week. Um, I don't think this is particularly like a mind blowing chapter. It's a solid chapter, but, uh, uh, this is a week where I feel like every chapter was kind of, uh, a, a build up to something bigger mm -hmm. and there True. wasn't anything particularly like mind blowing, but I do appreciate that there was at least this, this moment shared between, um, Reiju and Sanji. So I'll give it to, to one piece off of that. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. It does feel like this was another, you know, build up 
uh, chapter. Um, but, you know, it's like, okay, My Hero Academia, that's set up. Black Clover was a big climax, but uh, it, it did ring kind of hollow just because, just from the context of it, uh, Promised Neverland is built up. Uh, Food Wars was the end of a flashback that I wasn't too heavily invested in. And for as much as I enjoyed Fairy Tale, I can't name it the best because it's not. I liked it because it's the worst. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I think it is going to go go to One Piece for me too. But I'm not especially enthusiastic about it. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, my MVP, a character MVP this week, uh, I don't know what to put him down as. Put him down as Pip-Boy, I guess. We don't know his name yet, but uh, that that's my that's my character. He, he was he at least made an impact. I'm certainly not going to forget that fucking face hanging outside a wall, being like, hey, what's going on? Where are you putting that trash? You walking alone to your car later? <laughs> like, wh- what? <laughs> Bet you. <laughs> Wait until you see the next part of me that's going to be sticking out of this wall. Actually, Nick. <laughs> Correction, my MVP this week needs to be Junior. <laughs> but that significant scene this week of being in Ruby's <laughs> chapter of con- Table of Contents. I'm not putting that down, no, but it's, I, it's I will note it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with Reju for One Piece. Um, it, I mean, she, it, her conversation with Sanji was what I liked about the chapter. Uh, so I'm going to go with her. I will definitely acknowledge, though, uh, Pip Boy guy, especially because they, th- they expose one of Nick's greatest shortcomings in life: not having intimate knowledge of a popular video game <laughs> franchise. <laughs> oh, what a fool I seem to be now! <laughs> uh, and uh, our audience has voted pretty overwhelmingly for One Piece, so there you go. Uh, that is uh, gonna do it then. So, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Weekly Manga Recap this week. We record the show here on hitbox.tv slash T and twitch.tv slash T Wednesday starting at around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So be sure to tune at those times and to stay tuned to our to updates to our schedule, where and when we're going to be shooting it, because sometimes we have technical difficulties, like when Nick's internet cuts out right at the start of the recording and we have to start over. It was pretty perfect. Perfect. Right, right at the start of things. You can follow your hosts at Rolo T at Y Ruler of Time and the podcast itself at WMR Podcast. Uh, be sure to follow that one definitely because that's where we tend to do a lot of put out a lot of feelers uh, to get uh, audience opinions on stuff like, oh hey, what series should we add to the recap? Yeah, so. we just put a just put a poll out for that. So if you're listening to this, um, I'll try not to tweet any massive stuff from the weekly longer recap Twitter page, so it'll still be relatively high up on it and just uh check it out and, and uh put your votes in for that got a lot of recommendations for series uh, a lot of people are putting in their votes just note that it doesn't we're not necessarily going to be just picking the three things that get or four or whatever that get the most votes we'll be putting a lot of consideration to all of it but the popularity of it uh, of the series that like get a votes will definitely play a part in helping mm-hmm. us pick which ones you can also get in touch with us by sending an email to weeklymagrecap at yahoo.com. Send feedback, ask us questions for our Q&A episodes, and suggest future manga for us to read. Special thanks can also go out to our Patreon supporters. Your support allows us to create all sorts of bonus content for you guys to enjoy. Yes, we actually had quite a lot of uh, new patrons uh, over the past couple of days. So I uh, wanted to give a special thanks to Nico Harrington, Victor Lin, Anthony Carlon, Luthadel, Hassam Abbas, Kevin C., Michael, Tyler McCoy, Ancient Castle, Pashel Dooley, and Sheba. Thank you. Is there some sort of announcement that we made in the last week that people are really excited about or something? I mean, we did. There's a new, uh, like, milestone reach, so it kind of presents people. Maybe that goal popped up on there and and everyone was like, I want more Trollo T trivia, which I don't blame them for. Yeah. So, yes, thank you to all of you guys. Bro fist for you. It's much appreciated. And, uh, yeah, we are getting closer to quite a few new Very close and, and things of that nature. So We might we might end up getting sadistic, sadistic September this year. So <laughs> That's, yeah. Uh, brace yourselves for that. Uh, special thanks also go out to the guys who help make our podcast what it is. Steve Manor's Hawkeyes. You can check out his artwork in a number of different locations. Be aware, some of it is NSFW. 
So, He's got his own Patreon where you can check out all of the title cards for the show. What is not an SFW was his uh, title card this week for Welcome to the Ballroom, which it's I quite I, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I like that one quite a lot. So there were enough chances to draw cleavage, but <laughs> yeah, I know it was all over. It's quite there, classy. Right? So he, it's quite classy. Yeah, he was like, "I'm going to take the high road today." He's like, "Actually, my tit drawing pencil was broken." <laughs> so like, what the heck? <laughs> Every day, every time that happens, I have to hold a little funeral for it before I before I sharpen I send, it again. I send it out Viking, Viking funeral style out into a lake, and I launch fire your arrow at it with a boom shaped arrow, <laughs> bow and arrow. Well, that one asshole nephew is the one who fires the arrow, so I've got to take it from after it's the third insane. shot. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's some dude in the black playing a song on a sad boob shaped trumpet, <laughs> which doesn't help the sound. The funeral scene in Game of Thrones is probably my favorite scene in that entire series. You don't need to know anything about the series in order to know what the hell's going on. Please don't miss again. Oh, God, it's going to go off into the distance. (laughs) Well, when he fires and the guy immediately knows he's missed and then just takes from fuck's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Walks off like a badass. God damn, I love the blackfish. Mm. All right. And, uh, of course, also a uh, fucking infamous planet, too, by the way. <laughs> An infamous whatever. Who cares? <laughs> no time. Do we have a suggestion for, for, uh, that we're going to do next? Yes. So this one is a little bit of, uh, I guess, a test or something along those lines. So, test? Yes. Uh, I've, I've, I've... Test, test. This isn't I've, a test. I wanted to check out a series a lot of people have been speaking highly of. And I wanted to take a look at something that was part of the new Shonen Jump, like, free chapters offerings. Mm. So our next recommendation is going to be for Astra Lost in Space. Oh, so. oh, oh Chris, no, look at what you've done. Look what? at what you've done now. What? No, no. Now Annalise is going to freak out. <laughs> well, it might be helpful then, because I think we're going to have Annalise on the show next week, too. Oh. So it's all coming together. Now, I should note, just because we're doing Astra, Astra Lost in Space... <laughs> We won't necessarily be adding to the recap. That's still kind of up for consideration. But I figure it's a relatively shorter series, so whether or not we it's do a tryout, it, yeah, it, well, a tryout and also just a chance to check it out since you know I've been hearing a lot of good things about it and be interesting to see it. So all the chapters are for free on uh, ShonenJump.com, Viz.com. I think is the other place you can get them at. And uh, you know, as long as you're in one of the countries that they release their chapters at, you can get all of them there. Um, I'm going to probably, yes, I will probably be calling it Asta all the time. Like, still every so often, like, Asta lost in space, but they already have a character called Asta. Uh, but yeah, well, that's what we'll be checking out, and I think we'll be doing that next week, because there's only about 20 or so chapters of it thus far, so probably not going to be too time-consuming to read, but that's what we're going to hit on. Awesome. All right. Well, that's going to do it, then, for my recap. Uh, okay. What does L stand for? loquaciousness that's my character punchy jackson's ability to say very <laughs> verbose words as she's punching people despite <laughs> like someone's like all right all you gotta do is talk your way out of this situation it's like punch your way out of this situation gotcha that's why they Boy. call that's why they call me old loquacious jackson <laughs> loquacious <laughs> shucky ducky quack quack <laughs> it's like god damn it punchy jackson a, the A in special is for antidisestab... D- d- punch! <laughs> it's for antidisestab... Hey, I'm just gonna punch you in the throat now. Kablamo! <laughs> it's weird. I don't know what that stat would really be. What ho? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there... The E is for Englishness. <laughs> Englishness. I raised that stat all the way up, and then I'm just like fucking Vinnie Jones and Gav at like a, like a dinner party, and just like, oh, it's you all the mozzarella sticks. Oh, I thought you all the mozzarella sticks. Well, I helped myself to a couple mozzarella sticks, I guess. And that's what Gav just like shoves his face into the plate. And just like rises up with like six sticks hanging out of his mouth. And he's like, you won't, did you? He's like, no, boy, it's all yours. Mozzarella sticks? <laughs> mozzarella sticks? <laughs> Why mozzarella sticks? I just love the visual of Gav coming off the plate with six mozzarella sticks hanging halfway out of his mouth. And still having the gall to ask that he'd like, you didn't want any, did you? It's like, no, not when you shoved your face across all of them. 
<laughs> well, for me then, eh? Yeah, well, uh, you should fucking knack off then, bitch. <laughs> How can you talk this way to Vinnie Jones? He's so much bigger than you. <laughs> We go. <laughs> Where are we? How did we get here? It's weird. I didn't smoke pot before this podcast, but I feel like I did. <laughs> I've got the munchies and I'm giggly as shit. <laughs> oh god, bye.